listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. Gonna slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. We are back in the booth at the bomb hole, which is presented by none other than Pub Beer. Now, first things first, I always got to ask, Buds, how are we doing today, Doug? So good, my dog. Oh, that sounds good. That sounded good today. That was a good <laughs> one. Uh, to my left, we have Tyler Lynch in the building. How are we doing, Tyler? Doing great. Grateful to be here. We are happy to have you. For those of you guys who are unfamiliar with Tyler, he's low-key. He's one of the most underrated riders out. Great style. He's one of those guys that just looks right on a snowboard, period. Just looks right. Uh, but he's always been a little under the radar, but if you know what's up, you know T. Lynch is one of the dopest to ever do it. He's got a great perspective on snowboarding, the importance of community. He cares about our planet, bigger issues than that, and overall, he's just a great human. So let's just jump right into uh, the T. Lynch bomb hole episode. Let's get into it. So first of all, I want to start off by saying you grew up in Rutland area, and you grew up right next to Zero Gravity Skate Park, right? I did. Yeah. yeah, I can't help but say just thank you, too, first off. It means a lot to hear all that. But, yeah, growing up, Zero Gravity, I'm very grateful for where I grew up because uh, my parents moved to the house that I li- they've lived in still to this day when I was born. And uh, the skate park was right down the street, like literally less than a minute to skate down a little hill and get there. And... Uh, that's where we met all my friends, pretty much all GBP crew. That's where we all first met. And, uh, you know, before ever even getting into snowboarding, we were all skate park kids every summer. It closed down to be an ice skating rink in the winter, so it was just like a summertime thing. But, yeah, it started it all. I was raised by the skate park. Yeah, that's something that I really want to talk about because you were the, the youngest in the crew always. You were always the little grom. And growing up, um, I just think the importance of that skate park community, like that place to go, that place to gain some confidence, that place where you earn some respect at a young age. It's a community of people that take care of each other, even though some of them are a little rough around the edges. But yeah, how was is, how is that experience just going there every day, kind of just as a kid and, and uh, kind of finding yourself in a way? It's hard to even put it to words, but the way I like look back on it is that's where I learned everything and like the people, the way I looked up to them, it was like, you know, that's that's where I shaped what I wanted to be like and the way that they would even, like, accept me in even though I was young and just kind of, like, could be in the mix just because you're all skating. That kind of, like, you know, carried on into all of life of just, you know, more just connecting with people that you share, you know, share feelings with and, your parents were cool with just uh, letting you hang at the skate park all day? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, my parents are mad cool 100% too, just through and through. And, uh, you know, for them, it's... Give them a little air on. Yeah, mom and pup. <laughs> pup was just, you know, friends with everyone. And we were so close to the skate park. It'd be like, even if you're, like, leaving the park, everyone would come to our house kind of thing. And so that was, like, a back and forth. And, uh, yeah, just... This older kids really too, like they, they were making videos when they were all in high school. We're all like sixth grade, seventh grade, or just younger watching this, and they started making videos with like the VX, and uh, they did a premiere at the skate park, and that really kind of like showed us, you know, the possibility of just like homies making a video, and definitely it's been like since very early on, just like inspired to do that and then they even too would like put shots i remember lucas was in one of the first ones like oh damn like he could he could make it into the video even though we're younger and uh and then too very early on one of the kids he was probably like 16 i was 11 and he was getting into filming and he's like oh i want to make a sponsor me video for you so he straight like filmed me for a whole summer and made it into a little edit and that definitely like As soon as making, you know, first part, it's just like you guys talk about chasing the dragon. So it's been like ever since I was 11, just kind of like that's that's what got me going. You got that feeling at age 11. And from like an older (laughs) kid too, just like reaching out to do that for me because he's he's like, I think you could, you know, like we'll put something together. He saw the talent. 
Yeah. That's so one thing I got to ask because when I look at you, I think you're one of the most talented people I've ever seen on a snowboard or a skateboard. Like it just, like I said earlier, it looks right. It looks like it just, it looks like it comes really fucking easy to you. And not to discredit the amount of hours you put in on your skateboard and snowboard, but do you feel like, like it does come easy to you? Well, I appreciate that. The def, what I feel too is like I've just been doing it for so long and so much. It's like I'm most comfortable on my skateboard. And so I'm wearing like, I think about that even like with walking. It's like I feel more like myself when I'm skating. Like whether it be like social things. Like I'm not so good at like say going to a party or a bar. But if like we're at the skate park, I feel most comfortable. And, like, that's been something cool to kind of, like, reflect on over time. And I'm just grateful for it, you know what I mean? Like, being kind of, like, shy or insecure, it's just nice to have something where I feel like I'm part, you know, I can be a part of the... Mm -hmm. You feel more secure the second you drop in. You feel more secure, you know? Like, I'm not to say there aren't skate sessions where I'm like, I can't even drop in, but, like, Mm -hmm. it's definitely, I, I love being on my skateboard that's another thing we talked about this with nate whether we were talking to him, but it seemed like for him like life life was hard <laughs> but until in, but when you're on a skateboard or snowboarding or on a snowboard for that matter life becomes easy things right. Right. It makes more right. sense right and i feel that for sure and you imagine like, if you never found it you know yeah you know be interesting yeah can't say enough about it that's why i really love it now, what was it like when you're, so just to paint a picture, you're the young kid. You're, you're what, in six, I don't know how old sixth grade is. is yeah, that? pretty much sixth grade is like 11, 12. That was when it, yeah, I started like filming, but like started going to the skate park when I was probably like five. And uh, yes, yeah, same like Lucas, Ryan, my brother, like there's a handful of us who are like there from the beginning. Yeah. And Lucas being Lucas Magoon, what kind of role was Lucas uh, <laughs> seeing him when he was like a little punk kid? Not yeah. that he's changed at all, but it's crazy thinking about like coming on to do this because I'm like I feel like I could have a whole bomb hole just talking about my perspective on Lucas because <laughs> I grew up with him and like it just. What's your guys' age difference? Two years. Two years. So okay. he's the same age as my older brother. Wow. And um, he lived like just like a little bit further away from everyone, so it was kind of like. And went to a different, like, elementary school. But then, like, we'd all come to meet at the skate park. Same with, like, Zach and Nico and Matt. They went to a different school. That was where we all met up. And he was kind of, like, a little bit further to where when he would get to the skate park, that was his, like, unleash of, like, friends and, like, fun and action. And uh, he was always crazy. Like, literally, from the very beginning, it was just, like, crazy things watching him be him just so different but oh man he he really kind of like got me into it all too in such a different way like you know we live right there you go to the skate park also doing all these other sports school whatever but then like when I first went to Lucas's house that was the first time seeing like collages like this and like rows of videos and like his whole life was already like skateboarding snowboarding that was like his thing and just yeah he really like opened up that whole world to me of being like just how much you can like get into it and like be consumed by it and he's also getting big ass boxes from forum oh <laughs> and seeing that <laughs> that is huge. yeah that was crazy too that as far as to like just motivation you start seeing like what he was doing i mean even traveling contests early on yeah I think he kind of just led the way of like what's possible in this whole realm. I think that's also huge when you're from a, a smaller, if you're from the East coast, you don't necessarily see people quote unquote, make it out of there, you know, and to have somebody like Lucas, that's like paving the way in front of you and be like, Oh shit, I can make it out of this town snowboarding right. or skating. And like what huge. was the trip was when it was like the rail jam days. And like, we'd all go from like hiking a rail together, trying same stuff. Like everyone's like, you know, pushing each other, this and that sessions and then he goes to rail jam and all of a sudden wins like ten thousand dollars at once and it was like whoa like you could do that with like the type of snowboarding that we all do and that was like huge motivation for everyone to be like damn yeah when it came to contest lucas would just snap he could just turn it on and that's what to realize it's like he's just different even when we go to skate contests when we're young it was like i realized that like anywhere we go 
like everyone knows Lucas by the end of it. Just like any event like that, he just has that extra, you know. And too, when it comes to contests, the way like some people, you know, thrive under the pressure. Watching him, like we go to a skate contest and be like, everyone's skating, start seeing the runs, and then it'd be like he'd see how good people are doing, and then his run comes, and he's just like doing stuff you never saw him do at like a park we've never been to. He just like had that extra like drive to be like, all right, I gotta go in on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good guy to have on your squad. Huh? Oh. Now another thing I gotta ask too is, is you grew up being the young kid, and you're at a skate park, and obviously. There's a misconception too, because some people go to skate parks and they and they fuck off and they do drugs or they want to appear to be skating. They don't. They just want to hang out. It's a great place to hang out. But then there's people that just uh, show up and just skate like yourself. So what was it like being such a young kid? You know, you said you started going to the skate park around like five years old, and you're seeing older. You're being exposed to people probably you know smoking weed and doing other shit at such a young age, like, what was that like? You never seemed like you got super into that right. at all. And yeah, like, I don't, it's definitely just, I mean, part of it is, like, it must just be, like, me personally, just, like, feeling-wise, it just never related, but also, like, since I have my older brother and then my, my dad always kind of instilled into my older brother, like, take care of Tyler, like, you know, don't listen. So then it was, like, he had that guidance over me, obviously, to not just, like, completely just do stupid shit. And, like, that older brother figures that kind of just always, like, keep you in your place with everything. But I don't know. I'm just reserved, like, always just, like, observe everything, you know what I mean? And kind of, like, I love to be around it. I've definitely realized that later in life, like, even though I'm the shy and type of person I am, like, I love being around really eccentric and, like, people like that you know so i don't know i'm grateful it kept me out of trouble but i got to see some crazy shit too. <laughs> well, rutland is uh kind of a seedy area too in vermont i mean it's vermont people wouldn't think that but rutland's kind of there's yeah, some wild people some, crazy, some rough characters right <laughs> yeah all right we're gonna get into our first guest question of the episode this one's from zach doobie he's a gbp og i also owe a whole round of air horns for all those names you said earlier <laughs> i just couldn't get into it but let's get into the doobie question here we go. What up, Bomb Hall? Doobie here with a little guest question for my boy, Young Pidge. <laughs> Thank you, Grundies and Easton, for having this guy. I'm excited for this one. But while growing up as the young one of a rowdy bunch, how did you maintain such a positive and pure outlook on life while we were all flying off the handles <laughs> on some substances that we don't need to name? <laughs> you are a true Jedi, Tyler. Can't wait to hear this one. I love you, man. Thank you, Doobie. I love Doobie. He's been like a brother to me the whole time, ever since I met him. What do you call you, Young Pidge? Pidge. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> nickname. That's, that's dope. What's funny about the Pidge nickname is my dad called my sister Pidge. It's kind of a weird way to get it. <laughs> but he called my sister Pidge from like Lady and the Tramp, the movie, all growing up. And then like friends would come over and he'd be like, Pidge. And then he'd, at one point in time, Zach left her. He started just, like, calling me Pidge. And the next thing you know, like, some of the other friends are, like, hearing this, but they didn't know any of the backstory. That's, like, my sister's nickname. <laughs> so the next thing you know, like, I have all these friends calling me Pidge. <laughs> it's, like, pretty funny when that one It's a good nickname. About. It's solid. Yeah. Like <laughs> my boy it. Pidge over here. <laughs> yeah. Young Pidge. Yeah. But, yeah, I think, like I was saying, a lot of that had to do with my dad and just, like, the way he kind of instilled in me to just, like, be good. It was like his last chance. <laughs> you know? But uh, also my sister, my sister Pidge, <laughs> Heidi, she was um, such a good human. Sam And my mom, my mom just like kind of like her morals and everything, like really good people. And my sister is kind of too more like of a reserved human. And uh, she really taught me a lot just from her, her being, her way of being and um it was like i had both sides of like my brother and her and then you know and then another part i guess you know just how i wanted to be like just out of like watching everyone and trying to take my own part i just i think it's really interesting how you see some people that are very eccentric loud crazy party animals oftentimes get along well with the introverted mm -hmm. guy in the back of the room 
kind of yeah. observer like yourself. It's funny how there's that that attraction that works well sometimes. Even like like my girlfriend Allison, like it's very much that type of thing. Like she's like the life of the party and just like you know, very outgoing. But then like our combination, it just like when they know they got someone watching their back and they can do what they're going to do and yeah. they got someone looking out maybe. And I'm going to get into fun stuff yeah. even if I'm not seeking it out, yeah. you know, I'm getting going to be brought into the exciting <laughs> exciting <laughs> stuff. That's killer. Well, let's get into another guest question, which is once again presented by Capita. This one's from Lucas Magoon. But before we get into it, we got to talk about Capita for a hot second because I've been testing out a bunch of the boards. Uh, the Super DOA behind me. This thing is incredible. It's like it's almost too nice. I don't even. I don't even want to destroy it because work it's, of art. it's a work of art. Wow. Uh, it definitely is a high performance snowboard. Incredibly, incredibly impressed by their basically not only their factory, which is you know. 100% powered by green energy, but the production of their boards and how quality they are and the people behind the brand. So, uh, I yeah. rode the black snowboard to death thing is amazing. I saw you on that yeah. up at Goonfest. You're that, looking good. Once again, it's like a work of art. You don't want to mess with it, but man, hopping on a Capita for the first time, blown away. Uh, good products. I've, I've been blowing it for years is what I realized. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Great people. Let's get into, oh. let's get into a guest question from none other then Lucas Magoon. Here we go. All right, bomb holers. How's it going today, everyone? Hope all's well. Tyler, quick question for you. What's your best trick you ever landed in at the Brooks Gap in Rutland and the Rutland Fairgrounds? Gap. He's going to go with the Brooks Gap. It's funny because there's probably the same trick on both the gaps. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, Brooks Gap was like the one gap in town. And like that, see the older kids in the videos skating, and then we're like, oh, we got to go skate Brooks Gap, which became Bright Aid Gap. But it's probably like a seven or eight stair sidewalk takeoff. Um, one year, actually, that was kind of cool about it, too, is one year we were making a GBP video, and kind of like, you know, when you're going through the footage, and you're like, oh, damn it, like, I, I want something more, you know? So we were like, we would make it a part, and I'm like, oh, I need to get some more skating, you know? And it's like day of day before finishing it we and zach went out and i got tray flip on the gap yeah this was way back and then the fairground set that was one where like yeah first video part when i was 11 they like first time going out to street spots and uh i just ollied the nine stair or whatever and then years later after like you know traveling and kind of doing more stuff and then came back and I tray flipped that one, and that was like nine tray flip with nine. Yeah, damn, that's one of my, that's one of my favorite. Like, is this video shots. part when you're 11 online? So yeah, we can find is. sick. It was on a VHS tape, you know. And at one point, the uh, friend Jay from the skate park he took the VHS tape and put it online. Put it digital. Like, did that, yeah. Sick. And I'll Nate Kapitansky. Nate Kapitansky is the friend who made it for me. I just wanted to shout him out, too. Dope. That shit changed my life. We'll get this in the show notes so people can check it out. Yeah. Sick. So, one thing. <laughs> holy shit, lads. What's going on over there? Flipboard that era. We got a can. It's a, you should see behind this desk. It is basically... Uh, complete we like to live in a perpetual state of like yeah. a disaster back here we feel at home we don't like it organized we got all kinds of good stuff back here now let's let's keep this thing rolling so one thing that's awesome talking about is like growing up we were, we spent a lot of time together back in the day on the east coast you know and you're the grom and gooner was the grom and then you know, we did all these rail jams together back in the day, and like I don't, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but that was some goddamn special times back then. When yeah. did you guys bump into each other in the East Coast? My specific memory of it was uh, East Coast Invitational. Yes, that, that contest it? was East Coast so Invitational. Fired up. So that was like, yeah, big deal back then, like big rail jam, a lot of names you heard about and everything. And uh, was super special for me about that was so like. Okemo Mountain School, you know, there's a mountain school, Strat Mountain School, Okemo, Killington. So, like, Nico and Lucas ended up going to Okemo Mountain School. And for me, that was kind of always the, like, dream. Like, just want so badly to be a part of that where they, like, snowboard every day and go to these events and, like, school, you know. So I was kind of, like, always, like, trying to figure out how to do that. But, yeah, those schools are super expensive and that's a lot. And uh, 
But because I was kind of like friends with those guys and had rode with them at the mountain, the snowboard coach at the time, Kyle Plunkett, super, yeah, he's an amazing <laughs> human. He actually just let me jump in the van of the Okemo Mount School van to come with for this rail trip. And uh, and that was, too, I think, when I first met Doobie, like somewhere around that time. Like, Doobie was also part of the school. and So, yeah, we go down on the van trip, and I remember seeing, like, you and uh, Scott. Scott Steves must have been there. Yeah, that, he was there. That would have been the first time probably seeing you guys. Mm-hmm. And then after that, too, just, like, the videos and everything. But such just standout memories. That was my first time being in, like, a big rail jam setting and, I think I even, like, yeah, I got to, like, do it. Maybe even, like, made it to finals one of the time. So that was kind of, like, crazy. Like, I was tiny. You talk about yeah. the bobblehead days. That was straight <laughs> bobblehead mm-hmm. days. And just kind of got lucky on a couple of things and made it through. And that was, like, too, just pretty eye-opening. It was like, whoa, like, I can kind of be in the mix with this stuff. But, yeah, you switch front board through the kink. There's certain things that you just, still like, remember, remember that. so solidly, like, blown away. Like, you could switch front board through a kink. Mm-hmm. Like, wow. I remember I went, like, just, I'm going to claim, but I did the switch front board 270 through it. And I, like, at that time, I just got lucky as shit. I just <laughs> yeah. put it up like Yoni <laughs> Malvi and, like, turned. And, like, right. yeah, I think I won the AM. Division. Just the excitement oh, yeah. of the yeah. contest but just that was, brings those tricks out. Dude, it was crazy because all the dudes from Quebec would come down. I was going to say, like, what, Yan Dauphin yeah, and, and, like, ooh. Max Lejean Max was yeah. there. Like and crazy, you know. Then that was such like the like that rise of rail jams and like yeah, the East Coast when we don't have the powder and all this stuff. Like that was everyone's like. And you all focus. get to get together and see the real talent in the East and yeah. see what you need to like kind of build up your skills to be like, or maybe yeah. you already have them and it's time to unleash them. Scotty Arnold, uh, Scotty Arnold was announcing. Oh, right? really? Yeah, and that was like so cool just hearing. Him call your tricks going down. You're like, oh my god, Scotty Arnold's like <laughs> he knows I'm going through the course. This is sick. That must and have been a really cool event that too for that mountain. Like that mountain, I didn't know of anything otherwise. But mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, they hold this huge trail jam, mm-hmm. and there was probably cash on the table. I'd imagine mm-hmm. for amps. Must have been. I want a trip to. I got into the Vale session from it. Oh, sick! So then I went to the Vale session, which is this huge event, and ended up uh, completely fucking blowing it. <laughs> So all of a sudden, you're with all the East Coast. But yeah, then you're, you're with hot like, shit on the East. Then you go to the yeah. Big Dog Contest, and you're like, okay, I am out of my league. One time, you were the, the big you know, fish funny in thing about Vail Session, you know what you're saying? It's like Big Contest mm-hmm. had this. One time, Lucas got invited to the Vail Session for Slope Style, and I was like, this is when I first moved in with him in Colorado. And he's like, I don't want to do the like Slope Style. Like You can just take my spot. So I'm like tiny, too. I'll go into this big contest pretending to be lucas <laughs> you were just because you and had like, to be him right yeah and like <laughs> some of the friends obviously like just like fully knew like what was going on way out of my league going into these like huge jumps and stuff and like yeah How'd yeah you know? david benedict fun. sean oh, white was hitting him i think was... i probably like knuckled but at the time probably some of the biggest jumps i've ever had to do and mm-hmm. just had to try to spin just to like do something lucas was just like oh, I'm not yeah doing he's it. like you I'm go, doing you it. Go, man. literally yeah just like hi using his name and everything mm-hmm. was pretty funny. wow yeah. so and then at that time let's talk about your like s- whatever sponsors and stuff because I, I know i remember i i got you a solomon at one point right yeah yeah i always <laughs> think about that too the solomon thing like could have been you know could have been a whole different like story if that did just like play out but uh so see yeah so that was right around the time like I guess, yeah, if we want to get into that whole point of time, but basically my junior year of high school, like if you could picture my brother is just graduating, Zach Lefter, who's like filmed with us growing up, he graduated a year early. So those two are kind of like getting out and Lucas and Nico kind of like left school early and moved out West. So by this point, I'm like going to be almost one of the last ones back. I'm like, oh, I just got to get out. of. And so my guidance counselor helped me out to do like two half years. So my junior year, I would go until Christmas break, and then I was re- off the rest of the year. And then uh, I moved in with Lucas in Colorado, and he kind of like that. Everything was always like just take me under his wing, little brother. And this even ties into like he brought me to the Tech Nine Factory and got me one of the Midget Mafia boards. Sick. There's somewhere somewhere in this mix, I forget. I think it was like he got me the Midget Mafia board, but then. 
you came to town and then like uh, like Hava with the Solomon and that was like yeah crazy to think so like look it up to you and just like yeah Scotty Arnold was having there was like the Scotty Arnold mini pro and I don't remember like where in that back and forth like because I know I rode the Scotty Arnold for a little bit and was obviously so hyped on this potential opportunity with Solomon whereas with Tech Nine it was kind of like Lucas just like got me aboard at the factory it wasn't really like getting on the team or anything so i was super hyped on that but um i actually didn't like the board it was like too stiff like i'm so used to just like a soft little board you're a little dude a a little dude yeah you know and yeah and that shit really does kind of matter with how you end up riding it but uh yeah i don't know like how like that rest of the story was kind of crazy like just things with hava and solomon didn't really like work out i uh I remember there's a, we were out at Mammoth for an event and he like caught wind of something like he said what did he say I heard you dropped into the scissor or something like harsh reality because like you know the mo- night of like everyone's staying at Motel Six kind of like party night I'm like young one in the mix I was like Justin and Anthony somehow like a story got back and the way he like said that to me in a message like was so like harsh hitting I was like no like you're saying I was kind of always like you're around all these parties you know what i mean i don't i don't do that type of shit and then it was almost like the fact that he like took some story and like put that on me and then everything kind of just like never really worked out after Mm -hmm. that but i tell you like i saved that email because how much it like for years because how much it like affected me of like I felt like that ended everything from his perspective, too. Oh, damn. Yeah. Basically, That's, like, by association. By association, He yeah. thought you were partying and all crazy. Ended up, you know, catching winds of that guilt by association stuff mm-hmm. over the years. but uh, Just because of who your crew and, uh, was. I don't know. Sponsorship's weird. Like, I, that's, too, like, being younger and doing, like, flow of sponsoring this and that. It was, like, hard when you, like, you know, these reps it's cool like they want to hook you up to your kid but like when you don't know them personally or they don't know you that was always like a weird dynamic like i never even want to write an email to someone i don't really know to like ask for something you know and that was like so it's also like, it's also an interesting dynamic because the sponsors i, I do want to say on hava's behalf i know he was always a huge fan of yours so i do that. have to say that because i and that sucks that that it was that weird happened. but you know all all happens for it reason. all happens it's for a reason weird. but i think your two deals it was it was almost like i was i was taking you under my wing from a distance a little bit saying hey bring this guy on and then and then lucas is doing the same thing with tech nine so because yeah. you're so soft-spoken you're not right you know, you're not like hey man like sponsor yeah. me you know yeah because yeah. lucas will walk in and just say it right yeah. he doesn't need someone Yo, to push you around. gotta hook up young t yeah. lynch yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, it does kind of lead into, like, you know, how everything went for me. I think that, like, that kind of, like, seeing the sponsor stuff go down and obviously, like, wanting to be, like, have have that happen to kind of, like, keep things going or, like, yeah, just even wanting gear when you're younger or whatever. But because that dynamic became so hard for me to, like, figure out emails, keeping in contact, like, asking for things, like kind of like feel like entitled to like wanting you know but like that's definitely what led me to like kind of do our own thing with two in the future because it was just like that was hard for me to yeah and it's not it's hard for a lot of people i think to be like i gotta ask for this i gotta yeah like to talk about yourself and talk yourself up and tell the team manager what you're doing and Mm -hmm. it's just some people just aren't made for it right yeah let's let's run it back too because you're at this point you're 16 years old, right? Yeah. And you're living with Lucas Magoon. And at the time, Lucas is winning over six figures a year it's crazy. in rail jams. And he would just be like, let's go to the mall. Yeah. And you'd like, yeah. he'd like come back with like boxes of clothes with bedazzled. Yeah, Gen X. Gen he X. just had his Gen X relapse in the past couple of weeks. Yeah, he was there. <laughs> he came here and went right to Gen X. Yeah. Yeah, when I first <laughs> flew out like that, planning that that whole year getting ready fly out christmas break he was filming the fuel tv thing you know danny and the dingo or no fuel tv did like a little oh, like segment new pollution on, uh, or something like whatever that? it was yeah i know like you're a, talking about follow Sun, him yeah. day in the life yep. but more than just a day type of thing yep and doobie was actually out here too living with him in colorado and uh so like I'd fly out and then instantly they're like filming this thing and like dive into a little tour trip and 
yeah, everything, everything with Lucas was always like, just take me right into what he's into and just help put me up in any way you can. Like, I think if I he just, had like, money, you in. had money. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he just let me like move into a little guest room in their house. And I'm 16. I probably saved up a few hundred bucks and was just like, okay, go for it. <laughs> Let's do you know, it. No, no idea. But I saw what he was doing. It's like, shit, you win one contest. That could be, you know, good for long time after yeah that. food for six months so that was where i was just like just all in you know, go for it yeah so you're out west but we kind of maybe passed over a big topic that you had mentioned um the gbp crew can you tell us what is gbp yeah. and how it started and what it means what it stands for the the little origin of it is a little funny but basically it was like i think uh nico and zach you keep saying nico nico chaffee nico, nico chaffee yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's give, him a give him yeah. an air horn so it was kind of like those uh, three like grew up together. Nico, Zach, Lefter, and Matt Douglas went to a school growing up, and then like m- me, Dylan, Ryan, like that. We all kind of met at the skate park, but then those guys kind of started their little just like you know school gang, Green Bandits, and there was like a can of green spray paint and whatever. Started making little stickers and making little stencils to put it on so then they were like a little green bandit gang you know middle school or something stuff and then my brother ended up kind of like hanging out with them more and then at the time even like me and lucas and some other friends from the skate park were filming like our own skate videos we were already kind of into trying to make skate videos and stuff and then zach got a camera and they started filming everything and they were kind of even more like you know jump off of some random stuff or go smash that thing or like any random thing and just film it and then lucas kind of like we're all friends at the skate park but then like two little like video crews going on then lucas found out about the green bandits and he was like oh all in like gang (laughs) shit you know he's gonna make a stencil and bring down so then like it kind of meshed into us all just like filming together and it went from being like met at the skate park and then like oh yeah you guys snowboard and stuff too and then we'd start doing the snow stuff in the winter and and that was the era of just like you know everything we were taking in whether it be like cky videos like jackass on tv the older kids making videos just all skate videos so it was just taking like a mesh of everything we were seeing and just making our own version of it and uh pretty much like that since middle school just like every year originally it would be like little teasers or shorts and then i think the first video video was like 2006 and uh and then pretty much after that it was like we made a video every single year till like i don't know 2015 16 or something green bandit productions became a real thing yeah just a little over time just kind of like kept getting more and more it'd be like all of a sudden you know we're making videos like oh we'll make a t-shirt to go with it is green branded productions the same as the gremlins oh and then the productions part too there was like a ski crew called loose cannon productions i don't know if you guys ever saw mm-hmm. those or heard those they were like just crazy shit like that was kind of what transferred into like all of a sudden you're like flipping off cliffs or like smashing things or putting kind of more of that like crazy or like cky stuff in the mix so they had loose cannon productions that's where the productions got put on the green bandits to be green bandit productions yeah like just evolves you know the way that stuff does you go from just like making videos and every year you want to make it a little different you want to film a little something more you want to go to a new spot or travel to a new town and just that natural progression of making videos and and then what became so cool is just like we ended up just being that same crew for so many years and then the gremlins part what actually made it gremlins which is but yeah, cool little story. I remember I wanted to ask Lucas that on for like his thing, but so he moved out west to ended up moving into Big Bear and moving in with the Mazzotti's and uh and then it was always that thing of like, you know, these guys are on the same thing and same friends. So then we'd film we we're filming back east, they're filming some stuff back there, and we would always kinda like take footage from friends who weren't necessarily in town and put it all in a mashup. So he's like, oh, like, we're making a video and they're about going to send us footage and like, oh, we should call it Gremlins because, like, you know, you put Gremlins in water and they multiply. 
so he's like you met the Mazzotti's and the brothers were like the group is multiplying multiplying <laughs> so that was like where that whole thing came from that's so and sick. originally it was just going to be the name of a video like you kind of put a name to each video yeah but then it just like stuck then we're like the next one the gbp you know. crew is kind of the gremlins as well yeah and it kind of like explain like because we had our core crew we grew up with but really like as we traveled it's like anyone who was like on the same page friend we're in their town we're filming it shows us a spot like they're in it too it's just dumping it dumping just kept water on the, on the gremlin yeah, gremlin. yeah. <laughs> i remember one of lucas's first tech nine boards it had like all you guys on there as gremlins yeah. and it that was, was still so the sick. sickest yeah. gremlin graphic yeah i think on. that was dope i noticed in his car too he still has little gremlins in there and yeah, it's pretty yeah. Sick, so sick for all of for us, crew. that's definitely like the, like no matter what, that's gonna stick for the memory of like that's when it all started to like expand the group. On, when you like, guys were whole, cruising in a tour bus and you get out at like Super Park or something, you guys were like gremlins running through the <laughs> bar. <laughs> well, that's the thing side. too. Lucas was straight up like yeah, you know, he was a, living gremlin. Yeah. Like in Gremlins, <laughs> there's like the leader one, Spike. Spike, yeah, you know? that's Lucas. Like that is really <laughs> Lucas in real life, you know. <laughs> And it's we're all just like <laughs> <laughs> branched off of Branched that, yeah. off. You're all like a full character in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's got a certain look, too. Yeah. Everybody's kind of yeah, like everyone's got a look. wearing big gear, right. you know. Yeah. So that was fun, too. The, Once the kid that was kind of like, like a, a total theme. different looking gremlin. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Once that was like the theme, it was fun, too, like doing graphics and everything. Always trying to like base it off of that yeah. vibe of the gremlins because it is cool in those videos. They're just like run wild. Running but, wild, like, yeah. Bouncing um, off of everything. But Pretty yeah, sick. that was the main connection of just like the group growing. And the GBP Rutland video is a fucking <laughs> cult classic. Yeah, that is a cult classic it's without like a doubt. The soundtrack, you guys are like jumping off of shit. It's just like uh, young kids doing dumb shit and yeah. just destroying on a <laughs> snowboard, skateboard. Doesn't really matter what it is. It's the but, kind of video people need in their yeah. lives. <laughs> yeah. And that one was like, too, we even had like, there's two ones actually called Rutland. And. The second one that you're referring to is kind of the one once we all finally started coming west. So then the footage was like that. And, I mean, obviously the energy, too. We're, like, fresh out, so excited about every new experience. So then that's kind of, like, the feeling of the video. And, mm -hmm. yeah, meeting some new friends coming on, Shane Fortier, and just, like, other people just... Another, that that excitement one. when you move from the east to the west is like something that I don't know can even be described. Like yeah. it's just a, such a big moment in your life. Yeah, so excitement. Much. Another thing too, uh, going back about that, that's a, a important talking point too. You look at a lot of the way kids grow up and they make snowboard videos, and it's like here's our crew. There's like five of us, and like we're gonna keep it tight. It's gonna be exclusive, generally for the most part. But I think that community vibe of you know we're all in this together is is a is a cool underlying tone for your whole life too it seems like it doesn't really matter who it is whether you know you or lucas you guys both have this thing where it's like yeah bring all the homies yeah. come through and there then, then there's a fucking army well, of gremlins yeah, of in your house a full all army <laughs> yeah yeah like so much and i you know i hope everyone too who we did meet up with over the years because it would be like we're in Salt Lake or in colorado and Whoever the friend who's, like, that home base, like, we really, like, you're part of it. There's no, you know, I hope everyone, like, you know, felt it. Those who were around it felt it. But it definitely, too, got to a point where, like, felt the opposite. Like, all of a sudden we had such, like, this, like, gang presence. And then all of a sudden people, like, felt. If like they were was, on the outside. Yeah, on the outside. But it's, like, I definitely, like, I want, you know, those who were around it, I hope, felt it. No, like, we really were, like, anyone skiers there for the group of the day like any friend who's on the vibe like that's what it was all about it's almost like documenting i look back on it like that too like yeah we're always trying to like get the next best thing and make a cool part but like we were more or less just documenting like traveling and being you know trying to do it all yeah just like we saw in like the real videos going to events and going to the party after the event you know and just kind of like showing it and yeah I feel like people felt the vibe. Appreciate that. Seemed like it anyways. Yeah. Can no, the connections of, like, people still reaching out, like, to this day. Yeah, right. And kind of just giving their, like, you know, expressing their connection to it, like, means a lot. And I'm just, like, so glad to know that, like, yeah. So once they meet you guys, you're all so down to earth. And 
those who feel it know it. Yeah. I remember one time it was just like me and Zach too, like, and we're kind of more on the shy side. You know, he was too definitely growing up and we came into Salt Lake and I remember some of my friends like, oh, you guys want to do this? Or do you guys are actually like not really like, you know, party. <laughs> <Like, not, laughs> I was personally not really, you know what I mean? Always down for the ride, but we're not about, to, we're not like Lucas, yeah. you know, that's going to like bring it wherever he goes type of thing. But. Well, and Lucas is just parties no matter what he's doing. He yeah, he's exactly. not partying. He's just You'd like a, a wild character. Room, yeah, yeah. Like whatever. <laughs> you can just be out to a mellow dinner and Lucas is doing his yeah. own thing. Going crazy somewhere. Hibachi was when so he was funny young. the other night. You guys hit Hibachi? <laughs> yeah. How was that? It's it so fun. We had 20 people at Hibachi. Oh, wow. After yeah. the after the event? Yeah. Oh, it was wow. Fun. Felt like Japan style, like everyone go out to dinner after type of thing. Lucas is chefing it this up on the Hibachi. Volcano. <laughs> volcano. <laughs> just like literally the whole room. Just, it was so fun. All right. Let's get into the Pub Beer Crap Shoot presented by Pub Beer. Oh, that sounded crisp, buds. Yeah, this, that's a sound that I really like to hear after a hard day work. You know what I mean? After a hard day's work, you crack a pub. A pub crack a pub beer, relax, cheap, fun beer is the motto. You know what? Crispy, delicious is the game. You know what I mean? Let's go. You know what's good about pub beer is, you know, you are you, you talk for a living, buds. It kind of lubricates the throat yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it keeps bit. you lubed. <laughs> it keeps it, the throat <laughs> lubed up. Yeah, it keeps you talking. It's uh, delicious as well. Their motto is cheap, fun beer. Let's get into the cr- pub beer crap shoot. Here we go. Welcome to the Pub Beer Crab Shoot. All right, so you are going to go ahead and roll those dice. All right. And then uh, whatever it lands on, you basically just, uh, we're going to tell you what you have to do. <laughs> All right. Got the Goon Gear dice. Eight. Eight. Tell us about a breakout moment that launched your career. I guess in the sense of, like, what really changed it for me, getting into traveling. And I was hoping to get to talk about this story a little bit because it's cool hearing some of the connections. But pretty much, uh, well, because you said you were roommates with Bobby Meeks back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I, it was cool to hear because he really was, like, a, you know, changed it for me. When he started working for Nike 6.0, and they came through our home mountain, Killington, and... uh set up like a little snow skate park at the bottom of the mountain yeah, and like we you know which is something cool we could go snow skate the park and he's like see me he's like oh like we should go take some laps and uh he ends up just kind of like being like oh like what's your address i'll send you some nike 6.0 stuff and even too he's like what's your family he's got like my brother and sister and parents each shoes it was just crazy wow and you just met him at just killington? met him at killington and like that like he just you know, was doing that and helping out using his platform. So anyways, like, later that year, there was a Volcom Peanut Butter Rail Jam where if you win, you get invited to the finals in Mammoth. So I won that for my division and then got invited going to Mammoth. So I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to make this happen. Like, I'll hit up Bobby Meeks because this is now my new, like, person I know that in some position like that. And I was just like, do you have any, like, idea of how i could you know come out there any suggestions and he's like oh just like he's like come stay with me or come fly into socal i'll drive you up to mammoth and you can go stay with one of the other nike 6.0 kids so i go out this is my first time ever coming to california at all i'm 15 i think and uh he drives me up and basically introduced me to trevor jacob who was like that was all student Nike 6.0 and brought me up, did the contest, and then he just took off back to LA. And then I ended up planning a three week trip too. I don't know why I like end up being that long. And uh, and then like that, Trevor's family kind of just took me in, ended up being in Mammoth for a couple weeks. And then we went down to his other place. But that was like my first time to California. Obviously, just so eye opening. And just the that to traveling alone. That was my first time traveling alone, and just kind of like going going with it, going with the flow, and having like thing after thing work out, people helping out, and uh, that just really you know gave me all that drive of feeling like traveling is the way that you really learn the most. Like being out there and like yeah, just alone, especially observing 
seeing how other people live after that trip. I remember, too, because I was supposed to be in school, and they ended up, like, letting me out. But I had to keep a journal as my, like, that was my schoolwork, kind of. So as the whole time, I'm, like, journaling. And it's cool looking back because I really, like, got me in that mode of just trying to, like, think about your feelings and, you know, like, reflect on things. And that was the biggest takeaway. It was, like, traveling is the most, like, I learned the most just from seeing you know, You're meeting new these things, people, meeting right? new people, seeing how other people live their life. Because at the end of the day, we're just trying to like make a good life off of basing off of what you see around you and just taking pieces and being like. So yeah, that kick started it all. And I've always wanted to just like, you know, pay my respects to Bobby Meeks because like that was dope, pretty incredible. Just me being some random 15 year old and he was just like, come on out. And yeah, like, we got you. Yeah. And Trevor Jacob too. Like, Pretty, uh, pretty amazing the way they just took me in as just like some kid. That's one of the coolest weeks. things about the culture of snowboarding is that people do that for everyone, right? For, for different people, even all over just the world. Right yeah. now, this trip should be out here at Salt Lake, and Lucas was just like, you know, couldn't stay with their Airbnb, but he's like, oh, you guys could stay at Pat Fava's, and you know, he took in me. Yeah, and he Jake. just opens the door. They right? had like four people staying at their house with already six people. And I was like, damn, I haven't been in this environment in so long. But <laughs> like, that really is how it was traveling, like just friends and help out. And then you just want to be in a position too to like provide that on the other end. Like I've been helped out so much over the years. And a lot of now is trying to like be set up so I can help people out or lend a place to stay and pay it forward. Pay it forward. Yeah. Cause it, it's the only thing that made it possible. Now, there's something you said there I want to circle back around on. And you m- mentioned, you know, traveling and, and essentially learning through experiences and being uh, introspective, you know, reflecting on yourself and things like that. And I just find that you're one of those people that, that thinks about things on a deeper level than, than surface, you know. Uh, you analyze why you do things, why it's – you're not a greedy person. You think about the community as a whole. I kind of want to dive into some of that stuff. I know you mentioned earlier, you, you have a mood board at your house too, right? Oh, a vision board. Vision Vision board. board. Yeah. 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 It's kind of just like a collage. What what is, what is the vision board too? I'm interested in that. So pretty much like, I feel like my brain is like a collage and it's hard to, (laughs) but like, I'm trying to just focus in on like the things that I truly value the most and then put them up to just kind of, like, keep me focused on, like, what really is most important to me. And, uh, like, I've got, like, you know, my family on there, obviously, first and foremost, just to, like, have a photo of all my family. And then um, I put up, like, inspiring humans, so, like, that, like, as I'm, like, living and trying to take note on, like, who really are these humans that I'm, like, really look up to the way they've shaped a life. And, uh Yeah. Got some great humans up there. Who's, who's on it? Who's on it? I'll try to, like, remember specifically, but, like, that in the realm of, like, building, because I think that's something outside of somebody I really got into is kind of, like, homes and building and gardening, that whole, like, what, you know, keeps us alive, your living situation. So there's, like, Mike Reynolds, who does the Earthships. There's this dude, Sunray Kelly, who builds these really cool, just, like, really customize like art homes in a lot of like natural building and whole garden environment and then i got like in the snowboard skateboard realm there's i know steve caballero because i really like respect his way of going through this skateboard community and creating kind of more of like a lifelong career with it and he did his art and music and yeah just from skating i've always looked up to him kazu because uh, Kazu's just demeanor and, like, his balance of just, like, yeah, family, his passion with snowboarding and spreading that community. And then I remember when that Adidas thing came out and showing, like, his, like, gardening back home and family. And I was just, like, I always loved him. But after seeing that, that at in particular, I was like, damn, he is one of my favorite humans. And uh, who else I got there? I got this little combo photo of... Uh, Pat Moore and Chris Roach from Methodology. Because, like, uh, Pat Moore, I've been always looked up to his 
his way of like creating his like place in snowboarding, but then also to the things he's doing nowadays to like give back doing the events like methodology and kind of just, even whenever you hear him give a piece of his mind, it's like, damn, it's such a good human. Mm-hmm. Chris Roach too, his just style and just like low key demeanor. But then that photo of them both at methodology just happened to get. And then uh, John Cardiel for his entire energy as a being. Mark Gonzalez is the uh, same thing with the way he obviously is himself, but like his art and skateboarding, that was huge ever since growing up. Like, and you guys go into it the other day with uh, Eddie Wall when you're a young kid and like kind of everyone's against you in the sense like teachers and aunts and uncles being like skateboard what are you going to do when you're older and you get hurt so it was very early on that I had to like come up with my my answer in my head of like okay like how how do you keep going if you get hurt and so you see people like Mark Gonzalez and Ed Templeton and these skateboarders who started doing art and uh you know had that piece in it so yeah Mark Gonzalez and just very in, you know intriguing human in general that's an all-star cast yeah i can keep going but like that it really is big for me like i really like humans that i'm like looking up to and taking pieces from they give me a lot of like just motivation of like okay what's cool because we talk about the secret a lot of manifestation and yeah. part of that is building a board like that of and that's probably where i got to it be. yeah so it's cool that you have that yeah you know like yeah the the, the secret the documentary so I saw that when I was probably like 17. It's a picture like that, getting like a year of this traveling, doing all these things. And then I saw that and it really like made me like go in on like, okay, like I'm seeing this stuff happen firsthand. Like where can I take it? Where can I keep going? And the biggest thing I got from that movie that like I really value and not something I too would always like want to share. So in that documentary, they talk about like, you know, you have your dreams and goals, but you also got to, like, pay your, your gratitude. So it'd be, like, in a journal, you do, like, one page, like, things you're grateful for. The next page, things that you're dreaming of to bring into life. But that, like, balance of, like, being grateful and reflecting on, okay, like, which things basically did already come true. That balance of it really is, like, powerful. 100 percent yeah and there's even more to it there than that as well because uh if you if you break down a lot of that stuff too on a deeper level when you look at um take for example gratitude it's impossible to be unhappy about your situation if you're grateful you know it's it's a it's a perspective shift i'm i'm so thankful for these things and it can be you can be grateful or ungrateful in a great situation or a bad situation it's all your perspective yeah and um going back to the sometimes that that other thing you're talking about what you want is is in lack of if you think about like the goals like oh i right. i wish i uh, you know here's my goal for success well what you're really saying it's good to have things you want to achieve but you're also saying you don't have them mm-hmm. so you're in a you're in a space of what would be called desire right and desire is not a good place compared to grat- gratitude's gratitude, a much higher yeah. place than desire and uh so like yeah sorry no, go ahead. Go ahead. So I, I have one, like, I've done it for the past several years, and it's not, like, every day. I go months with, like, forgetting of it. But I have one journal that's just strictly gratitude. Usually just fill out a page at a time and just, like, you know, just try to, like, get through a page and don't go over. But when you reflect and read through that book, you know, I'll fill a whole one up, and then you start, like, reading back into it. It puts you in such, like, a good feeling of like only thinking about like yeah things you're grateful for and even while you're writing in it sometimes even if you're not in that good of a mood you could always just start at like grateful to be alive grateful for my family's health like and there's always something to be grateful for you know and even yeah i mean this this key thing right here and i've done a graphic for before it's like appreciation is the key to happiness and that was something through all the years of like doing graphics and everything that became one of the most like meaningful ones to me and just stuck but yeah it was just just kind of that feeling and coming to that of like that's really what makes you feel happy is just being in a state of gratitude and yeah very grateful for so much you know yeah that's incredible that's 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 a really powerful stuff for anybody you know and and it's hard when you're when you're somebody that's depressed it's hard it's hard to find when you're in a dark space 
it's hard to find those things. You could be scratching your head for 15 minutes, but then as you get it, once you start getting grateful, it's like you can just fill a page in, in a minute or so. But going back to another thing you said too, I think it's interesting with the, the get, uh, the, the vision board, you know, it's like just thinking about like, well, how do you, how do you figure, how do you figure out what you want out of life? You know, how do you go get the things you want out of life? Well, first you got to figure out what you want, right? Like that's the key thing. Like, mm-hmm. you, or, and it's cool. You can also float through and not want anything. That's a f- totally awesome space to be in. Totally healthy and, but like, how do you get what you want out of life? Well, figure out what the fuck you want. Yeah, you right. know. And like I in think, my mind, it's like it's all up there, but you almost have to like bring it in to be like, okay, what is it actually? You know, mm-hmm. what are the things you really, you know, definitely like that. Then also on the vision board, it comes a lot down to like the land, like the property and trying to do the off grid stuff and gardening, just trying to put that into the focus. Cause it's such a big thing, you know, and as you live life and you do all these things, it's like a, just a reminder of like, this is such the goal. And then, you know, and then beyond that too. And then that kind of, I mean, we're, we're probably out of order, but who gives a shit? But going back, you guys did kind of manifest a space like that. That's know? what was crazy. So like that, like 17, got the secret into that and really started putting it to practice like a lot. Like, and I, I always look at it as such. So like, you know, everything too with the videos and as a group and we're kind of like, just progressing and doing more and more traveling kind of have these goals of like traveling to certain places together all this but the bus like when we kind of had the idea to do the bus and make that happen in the way it was kind of like a group manifesting like we're all working on this dream and like putting that energy into it and then watching it like happen so quickly and the idea to do like the vegetable oil thing and trying to like well, explain run it back to the bus just for people that are totally unfamiliar what it is and how it runs on veggie and all that so pretty much like with the group one year we were traveling and it ended up being like four cars caravanning trying to like coordinate directions and where we're going and it was just getting so hectic and complicated not to mention we're using like four cars worth of gas just to get this group around and yeah just from inspiration uh like is definitely that like um, the further bus, you know, electric Kool-Aid acid test. I feel like that was definitely kind of like the the inspiration for the bus, that vibe of it. We're like, okay, we should get a bus, and we had heard that Max Weinberger had done a uh, yeah. big air horn for yeah. Max. <laughs> so like they had done the grease not gas tour back in the day, and like we we had become friends with him through time and knew that he knew about doing this vegetable oil conversion thing. And as we're kind of like getting older and getting hints of like all the issues in the world and trying to be like, where can we do our part? Like, how can we do something, you know? So like that four cars, how can we cut four cars worth of gas traveling? Cause we want to keep traveling down to just potentially running off veggie. So then it was like a group goal and like my brother, Dubbers, Nico, I think Kanoi, four people pitched in like a thousand dollars, got this bus for four grand. And then Max knew about, we got it with the full on plan. Like we had talked to Max, like, okay, we're going to get the bus and then we're going to do the vegetable conversion. He's like, yeah, I can do that. We're going to order this, this, and this. So it was like four grand for the bus and like four grand for vegetable oil parts to do that. And then as soon as we got it, it was just like, he, he did that setup and then had the plan to once we do this make this bus we're going to take a cross-country trip with like you know as many people as we can travel with it doesn't take gas just vegetable oil so it goes on diesel and vegetable oil and the way it works is so you have two different tanks you pretty much always have to start it on diesel to like kick start the engine and then the way the vegetable oil is it kind of like gets thicker and thinner depending on temperature so when you're running the diesel, say you're like driving for like 10, 15 minutes, the coolant's running through the system and the coolant line goes by the vegetable oil tank and heats it up till it thins it down. And then once it's thin, it can run through the engine. So you have a switch that basically goes back and forth. So we more or less like got this custom tank built that can fit like 150 gallons of vegetable oil. So you stock up on vegetable oil, you filter it out, 
just to get all the code. You like stop at Chinese restaurants type of scenario. Figure out like (laughs) okay, look on the maps. I go to Chinese food spot. Which ones like could you even get it from? And Max already had that little bit of experience Mm. too. So he really was like, like Crucial. captain of the ship, you know, and like he's a diesel mechanic. So just taking an old bus on the road, it was like more trustworthy to have him around. And he was all about the idea, you know, loved it. So, yeah, like it was just really cool in the sense of like you're talking about manifesting to like see like when we have a group in on one goal and all working together, like seeing that come to life was pretty unreal. And next thing you know, we're like driving across country we like had the idea to paint it next thing you know again james haunt to paint it through the just like just things working out you know what i mean and gbp stuff's doing well and we're kind of like you know progressing in that side of everything so it was just quite this momentum of like wow this shit's real like you you can dream yeah you group of minds you dream of something you all work like we could we can do so much you know what i mean the feeling and personally yeah that's how i was feeling at the time was like this dream stuff's work. What do we dream of? What is the goal, you know? And so that's what really got my mind going of like, and ever since moving away from home out West and seeing like the rental home, like you rent a home and then you move out at the end of the year, all that type of thing, like the home base factor in it all really started to come to like, okay, we got to figure out like what really does make sense for like living situation and home. And uh, at the time we were all like, living in a house together and kind of like the group thing and so as the bus thing was like happening and coming to life doing big things i was like what's the next step from here and started drawing and journaling and writing up this plan for like a off-grid living area that could kind of be for like everyone and this really like working out the dream in my head and to the point where like everyone all our friends kind of like knew uh, knew about the dream you know and i'm sure all feeling it somewhat but it really became my kind of like passion to like how do we bring this to life you know before we jump into this next phase i want to do a quick patreon question about the bus and first of all, thank you to all the Patreon members. Chris, you want to tell them about Patreon real yeah, quick? Yeah, Patreon, you know, we're, we're a podcast that's supported by our sponsors. That's a huge part of being able to what we do, do what we do. Uh, but also, you know, we're funded by the community, by the people. And whether you buy merch or you sign up for our Patreon, you're enabling us to keep doing this, this show. So a huge, huge shout out to our Patreon members for helping us. Uh, keep this dream alive, talking about the dream, you know? Yeah, thank you, every Patreon member. It means so much, no matter what level you're involved in. This is from Jeff Highbarger. Could you talk about a favorite memory from the GBP Bus It Tour? Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, glad to just know people, you know, connect with that whole thing, because very memorable time. Ah, uh-huh, memorable. Just a memory from the yeah, bus trip. it's a good memory. I was telling... Jake, we were driving out the other night. I was telling him a story of, it was crazy. So, you know, like SIA trade show in Denver. And so, like, we kind of had, like, a rough plan of what we were going to do on the bus trip and just certain things lined up. So we were coming back through Denver during SIA. And, you know, that whole event's, like, pretty controlled. There's not just snowboarding. There's other stuff going on. We end up just, like, pulling up the bus right out front of the building I think there's maybe like some other like big RVs and just parked it there. And next thing you know, we're just like, no one told us to move, you know, so we're just like parked right out front, basically (laughs) a giant banner, like in front of the trade show building. And, um, that was just kind of crazy. One of those things you just like get away with in the moment, just go for it. You look so official. No one's going to say a word to you. I remember seeing that. Yeah. (laughs) And then I remember too, I forget if it was the same one or not, but like there's definitely years like we weren't really, none of us had like passes or anything even to it'd be like people trading out passes or you get in through this and that and we were just fully go for zach basically like put one of our gbp dvds in the tv in the lobby so when you'd walk into the lobby there's just like one of the videos playing <laughs> on the screen you know <laughs> or just like straight walking around with the boards just like that's our like advertisement you know yeah incredible yeah just what Let's let's go back to where you're at. Just talking about uh, the Sababa land, yeah, kind of coming, coming to fruition. Yeah, so I mean, like that very much collaborative 
you know, nothing, none of that would have happened without group effort. And like my brother's huge part of actually making, he was too with all the dreams, definitely with the bus. My brother Dylan was very much like, you know, I could be far out dreams and everything, but he actually helps like actualize things and see it through. Even everything with GBP being like more of a company dealing with like distributors and the factory. He was always doing that. And, um, so yeah, it was pretty, the land, like the dream is out there. The first board graphic, even that when we did the boards, I, I painted up kind of like the dream of the land with like gardens and this and that tree forts and just like in the point of uh, visualizing it putting it out there you know thinking about it all the time but on the second board I put Sababa land is coming and you know like at that point like you know it's still just a dream and then one of the friends we end up meeting with like that our whole travels has always kind of been like meeting up with people we met with this kid Dan was also from Vermont and he's just one of those that's instantly part of the crew and he's catching wind of the idea and he's kind of like you know like I have some money that we could like do a down payment on a property you know and then my brother had like also been like working on farms and seeing how like people are doing this like off-grid type thing more so they kind of came up with the game plan started searching for property and then co-signed on it so in reality, it's like those two are like the co-signed on it. But then it's like the dream of it being like for everyone, kind of like compound home base was always kind of like a backbone part of it. And that's why I even too like kind of referred to it as the Baba land rather than just like Dylan and Dan's property. So yeah, it's like still, still in the works. It's still just like trying to keep that dream alive. But um, definitely it must have been right at that point in time where everyone's getting a certain age where you really start to like, feel the pressures of uh, life and getting your own home, people getting girlfriends, jobs. Like, so it kind of like thinned out the group during that time period. Some people just had different goals and kind of realizing like, damn, maybe this wasn't necessarily everyone's dream version of life. But for me, that was like, just keep pushing. Like we had the bus happen. Let's just like, keep it going, you know, keep us all together as long as we can get GBP to the point where it's like supporting the money side of it and everything, but uh, so so now you guys have the property. You guys got some skate still stuff there. on there. Yeah, what's what's on the property exactly? The skate setup looks fun as hell. The skate setup was quite the dream to to have that come to life. But um, yeah, there's a little skate zone that was very properly made by like Sizer, who's like made a lot of skate parks out in California area. And my brother happened to like we working with him and kind of explaining our plan and. He's like, all right, I'll come out there and, like, you know, do it up. And so that got made really well. And then I think the idea to do, like, the A-frame with the quarter pipes was really mainly from, like, you know, at Wendell's. They have that out front of the mm -hmm. area, just the A-frame into a quarter pipe. It's like Go back and forth without pushing? Yeah, it's just a big inspiration. We want flip trick feel, but we also want, like, transition stuff and a uh, nice little. And then the plan is to kind of keep going off of that, too. But that was the first How start. big is the land? Ten and a half acres. And it's in the East Coast? In the foothills of Tahoe. So basically, oh, okay. we were all living in Tahoe, and we wanted something, like, close to Tahoe, but just enough out of the snow line to be better for, like, growing season. Mm -hmm. And um, and you live on the property now? Not, like, full-time, no. yeah. Like, my brother has been, like, lived there for a time. Right now, he's not, but... um. We would basically just do summers, mm -hmm. so it was kind of like a chipping away. It started as 10, 10 and a half acres of, like, raw land. There's a creek running through it. So even when we were looking for property, that was, like, a huge factor. Is like, want water, Some, especially California. Yeah. Area, yeah. Yeah, even when we were looking for property, that was such, like, a cool time. Go, like, my brother talked to, a, you know, real tea type person who does that. But uh, So we had our criteria. She gave us, like, five pieces of property to go check out. And I remember all driving around a car, like, going to them. They're all this, like, barren-looking land, nothing appealing. We get to this last one, and you can hear the stream in the distance. And the trees are, like, more lush just because of that microclimate of, like, being by the water. Mm -hmm. And it felt like we found, like, a little patch of Vermont in California. And mm -hmm. we're just like, oh, my God, this is a spot. And we all go down to the creek. And literally, like, that first time sitting by the creek, it was like, 
this is the spot, you know? That's so cool. And then Dylan and Dan, yeah, did the things to make it happen. And those first couple summers, too, like, we'd all go down there and just straight, like, camp tents, all group projects, so fun. You just know? kind of chip away at the just land. Just that feeling, and, like, you know yeah. when you get to a campsite and you're like, oh, like, let's make a little lean-to over here. Yeah. You're at a campsite for more than, like, two days. You start trying to, like, make your little home, you know. It's start like, building stuff. Yeah, just forts, like, that whole vibe of, like, you know. So that was so fun to, like, be doing that with everyone. and That's cool. Yeah, we just chipped away. We, like, made, like, a little cabin, like a 10 by 20 cabin. One of the friends, Shane, had kind of, like, done construction. Everyone had, like, a little bit of this and that, but it was pretty much just DIY. Like, oh, yeah, a little, little lean-to cabin, you know, raise it off. And then we made another, like, 10 by 20 cabin that was kind of more just supposed to be, like, garden house, you know. So there's two little spaces but then we're still, like, you could end up camping there when you're going down. Or, like, I had a van I was living in for a little bit, and I'd go down. But just commuting back and forth from Tahoe. And then we'd kind of, like, trade off. Like, you stay for 10 days, and then you stay for 10 days. And uh, and that's, too, what made it hard. Like, the reality of, like, the money needed to, like, do that, you know, happened real fast, just realizing. And. My whole thing, too, is I was always watching and, like, trying to connect the, the snowboarding and skateboarding. I would see the money that, like, Lucas and Nico ended up making through snowboarding. And I was always, like, we need to, if you're making that type of money, let's put it in something that lasts for the long run, you know? So that was kind of always my goal is, like, if we can make the money through doing that stuff or even with GBP, whatever, like, let's just put it into something that will be here, something that can be for everyone, and so that's kind of like what that space is supposed to be. But then once you're down there and you're living off the grid, all this, uh, you don't have that money coming in. You know, <laughs> GBP was kind of like doing that. So like, you know, thank you to everyone who supported it and kind of like saw that side of it, that it's going into more, you know. But um, yeah, everyone kind of went their ways and we're still working on it. And there's been different years of living there more full time, but it's mostly been like a summer project. And we're at like six years, seven years. Sounds like a good time. All right, we've been cruising along pretty quickly here and almost skipped over uh, a favorite of the oh, show. We did. Do you know what that is, buds? Name that video part. <laughs> Name that video part is presented by Mammoth Mountain. The reason why they call it mammoth is because it is humongous, buds. Yeah, it's a bohemian. <laughs> it's a be- bohemian? It's That's a bo- huge mountain. <laughs> It's a bohemian. Uh, there's so much damn terrain there, you can get lost. Huh, Tyler? Yeah. yeah. I was blown away the first time I ever going there, how big that mountain is. T. Lynch went there when he was about uh, five years old at <laughs> Peanut Butter Rail Jam and uh, been killing it ever since. The park's incredible. They're, the crew does a great job. The jumps are so good. Best jumps. Definitely. Half pipe's amazing, all three of them. Mm-hmm. And it's great in the winter. You can ride powder in the spring. You, If you want to get better at snowboarding, Go to Mammoth Mountain in the spring, and you will get better at snowboarding. That's a fact. And while every other mountain's closing down, this place is just going. They go till 4th of July some Yeah. Now, before uh, we get into the name that video part, we definitely got to hit real quick uh, what they're doing. What are they giving away, buds? You're going to get four tickets to ride if you play this game, name that video part, and win. So the way we do name that video part for the listeners, the second song that we ask, if you know the answer of what it is, for the video part, we're your uh, first person to comment on Instagram on Tyler's thumbnail photo, the, the main first picture of Tyler that comes out. Uh, we will pick our winner there. First person to comment gets the four lift tickets. That being said, let's get into name that video part. Now, Tyler, how you feeling? Zero through 10 confidence level. <laughs> you can go with a six. Six. That's strong. Yeah. It's a little that's above th- half. I yeah, don't know. That's a little good. above half. Okay. Uh, didn't get any hints, any crumbs. I just went off of just random video part. Thought you may know it, may not. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so the, the actual video that it is, that will be a little tricky. So like Lucas's. Is... That's Lucas Magoon. That's correct. And Woo! Let's see. Oh, man. Is that? I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know the answer to it. So it's either. It's either <laughs> that means you can't lose because he doesn't know. Old world or. Familia? Familia, but I think it's almost... Was Cold World before Familia? Or, here, I'll, let me try to think about it. So it's... Cold World before Familia, because there's Familia and there's Familia or what about, is it Was it Hard to Turn? Hard, yeah, Hard Could to Turn. Could be earn. Hard to Turn. 
No, because was he in Hard Earn or? Uh, psh, I they all blend. I think it's cold. We'd have to. Can okay. I phone a friend? Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> you know what? I don't know the answer, so I can't help you. But you did win a little prize <laughs> it's, back. It's F O D T. Oh, we know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a Lucas Magoon part. Back when they were using Thank those you. big beats, that was a great part. Oh yeah, I'm hyped to get some bomb hole merch. Yeah, he's got some bomb hole merch in there. He probably got a mug. I don't little, even know what's little in there. Bag of merch. Yeah, you get to bring one of these home. Yeah, all this That's stuff good. available at bombhole.com. Coffee shop. If you want to support. Merch. Now, now let's Hell do yeah. the the one for the giveaway here. Four lift tickets coming your way to whoever wins this. Okay, guys, if you're listening, focus up. Here we go. Just a there it rock is. and roll singer yelling, huh? <laughs> raging, tricky one. Yeah, solo there. Okay, here we go. Thank you guys for playing. Name that I'm still gonna be thinking about which video it was. <laughs> On it. It's probably Cold World. Yeah, that's crazy. Whoever, someone's gonna get that instantly. What's that? That that, that uh, name that yeah, video it's part. It's not that hard. It's not. No, if you know, if you know the video, it's not that hard. If you know, you know. I think it's a good time to get into a name that video part by name that video part. I mean, guest question actually. <laughs> <laughs> so guess name qu- that quest question. <laughs> <laughs> so this question is from uh, Mountain Dew athlete Red Gerard. Uh, yeah, Mountain Dew is presenting this guest question. And here we go from Mountain Dew team athlete and also Olympian gold medalist. Here we go. What snowboard video part would you guys describe as the all time best? Trying to think of it. I guess like one that just like the overall like vibe is so memorable for me is uh, just Lane Knack in Chronicles of Narlia, the video that you made. Wow. Yeah. I love that answer yeah there's a there you know they're endless i think that's a great so answer many. that's yeah. a cult classic because yeah. lane made his own video that year cruised around filmed everything was vx i was with him for that yeah video yeah that's one of my favorite videos yeah for sure it was the matter of the song too it's like that like remix was it mob deep mm-hmm. that was sick yeah incredible video i gotta revisit good that. answer i gotta revisit that we'll, we'll pop it up in the uh, show notes so right. you know you you've been talking about your brand you know you and your brother starting a board brand and I just want to get more into that because you talked about dealing with sponsors. It was hard for you to hit up team managers and send emails and you're like, fucking, I'm doing my own brand. So how did that come about and, and what's the deal with it? Yeah. So it's like, it's definitely like long story, lots of little intricate details. So I'll try to figure out the best way to put it. But, uh, at one point in time, like we had a friend, Dave to if you guys remember cake, Dave, Yep. So he came through and kind of like ended up staying with us in Tahoe. And he had this plan to like go, after he was leaving Tahoe, he was going to go up north to start like his own board company. And he was going to buy X amount of boards and then sell them. And I'd never like heard or known that side of like doing it. You know what I mean? There's just snowboard companies. So getting to see firsthand like, oh damn, you could just like get boards and sell them. Like, and, uh, and then he was doing art and like graffiti art. And this is a time when I was just really getting into art and like away from home, just really doing a bunch of art stuff. And so we'd like talk ideas and everything. And then when he made his first board, he kind of like gave me one of them and as a friend. So that was one of my first times as a, with the sponsor stuff and reps and all this. It was like, no, like he's doing it. I know him. I can hit him up. It's a friend basis. Like this is cool. I can be a part of this company, like, growing from the ground up, and I'm not afraid to, like, hit him up, you know, it's just, like, homies, so he knew I was all into art, so as soon as after, like, a year down, I was like, okay, like, I'm gonna work on, like, making a graphic, I had always wanted to do board graphics since I was, like, a little, little kid would, like, draw pictures of mock-up ones, and so this is finally a chance maybe I can do that. And so in my head, I was like, I'm going to make, like, the dream graphic. What would be my, like, ideal thing to look down at under my feet? So that's where I painted up, like, the land. So it was, like, me as a monkey, like, at the land with gardens and tree forts. And I wanted a wood grain board. I always loved when people had, like, wood grain boards, so the wood tips and tails. And then I was like, all right, what would be, like, the dream base? And for me, that was just GBP, just big old GBP on the bottom. I was like, could we maybe do this as, like, a collab? How would this work? But then I kind of had the thought, like, Dave, you know, he was about it, about the crew, but he wasn't necessarily, like, 
doing that shit for like everyone like didn't want like everyone on the cake team type of thing i was like kind of like ah this this won't really work out but i really want a gbp board base and at the time dylan was riding for smoking and smoking factory was right down in reno we were in tall so it was kind of like you know what like we could talk to jay and see if he'd be down to like make a few boards so we'll just like make a couple boards and back then my idea was kind of like you know you make one board or you make two boards you sell one you get one for free and we'll just do that for each of the homies but it doesn't really work like that with like minimums and other than everything so it gets complicated it gets huh? complicated but that was like the little kid dream it's yeah. like you know we'll just sell it for the price that it would pay for two each person gets one so then uh so Jay was down to make them, you know. Smoke I don't know. Jay, if, uh, an air horn. I know. Yeah, Jay. smoking I, Jay. Avid listener of the show. Oh yeah, yeah, and like that, smoking Jay was from Vermont. Started a board company out of his garage. We kind of had that met him in Tahoe and had that connection of like, okay, this is like snowboarder made. Like he's from Vermont. You know, respect for him starting that from the ground up, and uh, knew him on a personal enough level that you could just kind of like talk about, can we get some boards made? But I don't think there was there was no plan of like we're gonna start a new snowboard company, you know, and like I don't think he really knew like what our bigger plan was. We didn't have much of a plan, you know. Just had a graphic and wanted to get a board that said GBP on the bottom because we make these videos and it'd be cool for that to be like in the video. And like that, as people are getting different sponsors, and all of a sudden there's just like this board, this board, this board. It was like it'd be cool to have a GBP on there, but um. So Dylan more or less lined it up, talked to Jay, and we're like, okay, we can get a board. But then it was like, you're going to need to get, like, at least this many to make it worth it for him. So whatever it turned into, like, this is kind of, like, part that went beyond me. And I know it was, like, Dylan and talking to him to figure out, like, okay, we're going to make this many. But Nico just got form just ended. So he still had money from that whole run of everything. And we're doing this plan, and we're all very involved with GBP kind of, like, progressing at this point. So he ended up throwing down, I think, like, six grand to get, like, X amount of boards made. And then we didn't really have much of a plan. Just sell those till we make the money back, give a few to the friends that don't have board sponsors. And then, uh, yeah, like, that was the first year. Got them to, like, the few friends, like, and... uh and then we're just going to the next year, like, okay, let's make another graphic. Let's so like a big part of it too, I think, was kinda like seeing Lucas and Nico do the like the forum thing and they were kinda always that like next step above, getting the free gear. And then we still have like all our other friends who are like doing the same shit. We're all still out there filming, doing our best, but not necessarily getting all that, you know? So we just wanted to like do something to like get boards to those friends, you know, keep us all in the mix. But also, now with the idea of being able to do graphics, it's like, whatever. You don't necessarily need, like, pro model, paid this, but, like, you can get your own graphic. So we kind of just, like, first year did, like, three boards and just, like, went down the line of each of the friends. Like, every graphic was based on each friend's, you know, idea. So, like, Dylan, everyone would give me an idea, and then I'd try to paint it. You did so, all the art? Yeah, I was trying to really, like do that you know it's been a dream to just do art stuff for skiing and snowboarding so it was a cool way to be able to start doing that and then say for example like the second board is almost i always think of this because it was almost like a statement to be like you don't have to be pro or anything but like our homie migs you remember migs mm -hmm. so the second board graphic was a migs mi migs graphic <laughs> he doesn't even really snowboard but he's part <laughs> he of the friends down though. Yeah. He's, he's part of the group yeah. you know and that was kind of the whole point like if you're part of the group it is what it is, you know? So we did, like, Mix, and then Dylan, Nico, Peter, Ryan, you know, just went down the list until, like, everyone got a graphic over the... In Japan, too, they were down with the... Well, that's a big yeah, part were, of it, too. So, it like, the there. Japan really, too, like, even bringing back to the bus, four friends pitched in on the bus. The other four grand came from GBP because Japan sought us out to order videos and then asked if we could make like t-shirts and hoodies so we made like a four grand profit to gbp the company and that was like a brand new thing yeah maneuver and line since there, there was, was no yeah maneuver guys. line and that was because of lucas too yeah, he went he, out with tech nine and he like 
GBP. So the next thing you know, they're like, what's up with this? Like, how do we get this video? How do we get it? The so, president of Maneuver Line just loved Lucas. Yeah. And he, like, barely spoke English. And he's a full, like, businessman. And he's Lucas would man. just have his arm around him. And just, they couldn't really communicate, but they could communicate. And he just, whatever Lucas was down with, he would be like, all right, let's do it. So great. It's pretty cool how he backed it. That guy, yeah. And they really, like... <clears throat> Making GBP what it was, company, like, I, that was Japan. Like, they really, like, did these big orders, gave us a chunk of money to, like, make more things and make the boards. And then we started making the boards and then be like, oh, can we order this many, you know? And then that that's why we would make more because they made it possible and then backed it into... I think they'd probably make it easy for you to, like, not have to... They'd give you money to help support. Yeah, it a exactly. Bit. The yeah. way that stuff works is you kind of pay you like a deposits. percent up front and be like, "We want this many boards." Yep. So then you use that percent to actually get it made. And Japan would kick a little up front to help. Yeah, help get done, which is so pretty they rad. really like made all that happen for us. And then uh, by the time I went to Japan, it was so crazy to see like people out there like wearing it. Or riding the boards, you know, because it never really got like you know out here. It was still just like our friends, pretty much. And then you go out there and it's straight like in the shops and like random people wearing it. And it was unreal. And, and I, I heard loved you guys talking <laughs> to your brother when you went out there. You know, they they latch on like your style there. Like you're huge out there, right? It was cra- like yeah. I don't know how to like. I mean, just like people talk about, what you see in videos where it's like this like superstar type Beatles fan type shit. All of a sudden, I'd go out there and have that, and I don't know if it was, like, from just straight GBP stuff, but then also Takashi, who ended up bringing me out there for his trips, he kind of would make videos and bring them back there, so I think it was kind of the combination of the two, but yeah, next thing you know, it was, like, they're setting up, like, signing stations at shops, I'm going shop to shop, and, like, you know, stopped on the mount. It was crazy. Just and like those stories. I just couldn't so even cool. believe it the whole time. And then time. Kazu, isn't there a cool thing where Kazu had your back too? Yeah, that was that was really crazy to see. He put on a rail jam out in Japan pretty much for like his friend crew that was more like rail oriented, kind of like some of the younger generation. So he put together a rail jam and then let them kind of decide like who, who do you guys want to invite out? I'll pay for flights and hotels and get this like rail jam thing going and they invited like me justin anthony johnny o'connor one year krugmeyer and that was like pretty incredible experience you know seeing their crew the stomp crew and those guys are dope huh? yeah, so <laughs> dope Big old yeah yeah i mean i could go on you know, but didn't Kazu did say that. you were like the best rider or something? Well, like that? basically, they did the contest. They were making it a rail jam event at the lodge of his homies, like the family ski resort kind of thing. I think I've been there. Is it in the backyard behind the the resort? Yeah, I've been I've been to a like a, a backyard rail jam setup in Japan somewhere. I don't remember where. Kohei, Kohei, Kohei. yeah, yeah. Glad I got Let's it. give Kohei. It. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Kohei's family's resort, and they have, like, a back deck lodge, just like any ski lodge, and it has rails coming down, closeouts. So they invited us out, and the days before, they had all of us who were going to do the event build the setup, which was super sick, too. So we just made, it was like a street spot, you know? Basically set up this street spot in as many ways as you could hit it. And then it wasn't even, like, a contest contest. Like, they didn't have people come out the first year I went, and, like, it was basically just a session, they had like yeah all of us session and then we were just going to do like ride or judge so at the end of it everyone decides who wins it's like yeah everyone just powwows like yeah just kind of like a shouting thing of like who do you think this person and they got down to like me and this one other homie from japan i think it was alex but so then it was like kind of like they couldn't decipher like everyone's just cheering off we're all just fucking cheering for each other like hyped (laughs) but then it was between me and alex i think and then they're like, all right, Kazu, like, you decide. And Kazu is like, Tyler. Nice. Like, to this day, probably, like, the craziest contest feeling. Because you know what? At the end of the day, it's about, like, you want the support from your peers. And that was, like, one of the most, like, oh, yeah, crazy. And you a know, guy looking, like that. Looking up to like Kazu him. so much. Yeah, and, like, just all the friends, too, at the time. And what was cool, too, looking back, because I kind of, like, feel like i never did that well in contests i'm not that good in that environment but um 
when I was there, the thing was so cool. I'm looking at it like I'm just trying to get shots like we're out at a street spot. You just want to get shots during this cool event. And just like rather than being like, oh, I just fell three times. Like I should switch it up to something that I'm going to land or whatever. I was like, no, I'm just trying to get a clip for this edit of this event. And then it turns out that I ended up probably being better. Once I did finally land a trick, it was something I really wanted to get. And that was kind of a cool thing to kind of like take away from that. Just more like a session, huh? It was more like a session. And then, yeah, just realizing that's kind of how I function better. I'm used to like being at a street spot and just trying to like get the trick you want to get. Not trying to Instead think of, of like, did calculate. I land five times? And am I trying this too many times? And yeah. You know. Playing um, chess, basically. Your brother, your brother Dylan, super, you guys are super close. He, he mentioned when I was chatting with him that you're kind of, when you're snowboarding, you're kind of chasing that, like, feeling of doing the, the trick perfect. And it's the same as art, too. Mm-hmm. Is, is that a correct statement? You definitely. Like and, like, definitely the more time goes on, the more I'm just relating it to that way. It's just so much about trying to, like, feel certain feelings. And Dylan, too, like, very early on making videos, he was the one who kind of, like, when it comes to editing, it'd be like, should we run that? Like, nah, like, that's that's not, like, as good as you want it. And he was one of the first to really kind of, like, put that into the group's mentality of, like, you don't want to just put in a shot that's, like, not 100% what you were mm-hmm. going for, you know? I remember one time, too, Bradshaw, with him out there with him in Japan, an interviewer talking to him about, like, you'll land something, but then you keep trying, like, 10 more times. It's like, no, you, it's about the feeling. Yeah, maybe you completed the trick, but you're trying to get it to feel a certain way, and then, yeah, you're chasing that feeling. And then that's where, too, it can come down, and then all of a sudden you don't need to do the craziest trick, but you just get something to feel just right, and, like, that's, you know. And you know you did it a certain way. Yeah, that, like that the littlest constant. thing, like literally just, like, a nose tap on something just because it, like, felt right, or, like, you know, all the big bear homies, too, so on that, like, you get the tap to the wall catch, Littlest feelings can be so worth it just because, like, the finesse, you know. Totally. You can back lip or rail and you can go to the end, but you might, you want the one where your your body positioning is just right. Just, the one yeah. the way that you've been dreaming about that you picture in your head when you think of the trick. Yeah. And then when you do it, it's like a fucking borderline orgasmic. <laughs> yeah. It's chasing <laughs> that. It was sick you know? watching you at Brighton the other day, too, because you were you. just right back. Looking yeah. so dope. It was great to yeah, link up with you guys there, too, and just kind of break the ice for this, but then also just reconnect of, like, this is, like, how we know each other. Yeah, props to Gunnar for pull, pulling that yeah. together, getting everyone, Such getting everyone together. Feeling. Just now, that feeling of snowboard events, hiking mm-hmm. a rail, group setting. It's yeah, Lucas does it right, just a session, huh? Yeah. No organization. Yeah. Everyone just following them from spot to spot mm-hmm. like the Pied Piper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Over here, guys. Yeah. Let's move to the down flat down. Oh, so great. <laughs> and then let's let's uh, let's stay on that that feeling topic because how does that's the same thing the way it relates to art too. For you. Yeah. Because you paint a lot, obviously. I paint a lot that. and I feel like they're both similar where it's almost like you're never fully <laughs> satisfied. Just like filming a part. You know what I mean? And even with painting, like, I'm always so critical of, like, ah, oh, I could do that better a little more. And then now, too, painting has really become, like, skating and snowboarding for me where I'm, like, working on it. And I feel progression. And that's what keeps you going because I feel like the things I do wish to do, whether it be a trick to feel or a painting to paint, the expectation and thought of what i can do is so far that i'm just continually just trying to like get there and like so not close to being settled with either one you know you're chasing the dragon chasing the dragon <laughs> yeah, all around like a drug addict yeah. looking for that next oh, high yeah. in a Full way clip but, addict. Yeah. anyone who's filming with me knows and the friends who've been there like i will not stop at a spot trying i feel bad for the people filming and everything but like <laughs> Luckily, it's this fucker gets his shit quick, dude. <laughs> it's it's easy. It's he makes it sound bad, but it it's not. It comes it I comes. Quick. I put I put Zach through some long sessions. Thank you, Zach. Speaking of the kid, Zach, uh, we have a guest question from none other than the kid again. Here yeah, we you go. Got a hold of him. Nice. <laughs> What's popping, y'all? It's the kid. <laughs> um, just got off the phone with Nico, and he was supposed to ask the question to Tyler for the bomb hole interview and for some reason like he didn't want to do it so 
he called and told me to send him this video. Zach's all nervous. <laughs> and I thought it was it would be a good question to get Tyler's perspective and thoughts on the King's Beach house and we're all living together. Like 15 of us. We had the bus parked outside. I lived in like a room that just had bunk beds in it with Tyler and his brother and people are cycling and yeah, just a lot of partying and stuff going on, but, and you could see it in the edits, but the edits a lot of times spoke for the whole group, but it wasn't the, it wasn't a group mentality always on that side of things, on partying and our lifestyle and the way we were living, so. Anyways, much love, peace. <laughs> Sick. You got pelicans and I know, I was going to say, you could hear all that. What's going on there? He's, like, down in Mexico right now, and, like, yeah, I gave you his number, I didn't know if he'd be able to reach him. It's funny, too, to hear Zach all nervous, too, like, you know, everyone sees it, Zach, it's a kid. Like, I know Zach deep down, like, we're both shy on the shy side, and he kind of, like, broke out of that, you know what I mean? It's cool to see you. But same when I did Lucas's question. I was so nervous in my room, like doing the recording over and over and over. <laughs> Gotta get it just right. Yeah. And like that never felt just right. You know, yeah. Even when it came out, I'm like, fuck, I should have asked something else. <laughs> but yeah, great to, you know, hear Zach. And like, uh, yeah, that that those years were very, you know, a core part of the GBP. It's like just the building everything. blocks. Yeah. Huh? When we were finally all in one place, you go to go to the mountain, you go to go to a spot, we're all already right there. It just made that part of it so easy. And it was nonstop something. I love that feeling, you know what I mean? I've been away from it now for a few years, and, like, obviously that's, like, good to kind of, like, move on from it. But, like, man, I loved it. Every day you come home, there's going to be something going on. Everyone in town, like, I remember, like, that, Johnny Laz and Xander, just all these friends who were just like, well, Bateman, it was like everyone would be there. And yeah, yeah, have great, great time in Tahoe, and I miss everybody. I mean, I'm still in Kings Beach right now, I moved back to Be Kings Beach, but it's so not the same without everyone there. Excited Crazy how you can do that when you're young, huh? Live 13, 15 people in the house or whatever, yeah. and then you get a little older, you're like, oh, wow. Yeah. Never forget like those just times. Me and my girlfriend <laughs> and like, damn, roommates. That's it. You can't really have a girlfriend in living in that scenario. Yeah, that's so why I like, brought to it too. <laughs> like they held it down, went down. But uh. all right, let's get into the Volcom bomb hole of the week. Bomb hole of the week. First, let's talk a little bit about Zip Tech. What is Zip Tech, buds? Well, first of all, I don't know if you've been watching the Olympics. It's it's over now, but Volcom. Had the outfits. You think those guys were using ZipTech? I think a couple of them could have used it. Could have like. used ZipTech, yeah. right? And what <laughs> ZipTech is, connects your jacket and your pants with a zipper that's in the powder skirt. And what it does is it keeps the winter elements out, keeping you drive, dry. Keeping that's you, absolutely fascinating, Keeping buds. you dry. <laughs> keeps you driving as well. It keeps <laughs> you driving. Yeah, fat on your snowboard anyways. It keeps you out longer. keeps you warm. Keeps the snow out of your pants, which is a great thing. Uh, pantalones, for those of you who speak Spanish. Everybody falls. I don't care what skill level you are, from Pat Moore to Scott Blum to Haley at yep. the Olympics. Or did she? She didn't Haley fall. Haley Lang. Uh, she put down a run. She put down a run. Yeah, everybody falls. And what this is going to do is uh, keep the elements out and keep you warm. All right, what are we doing here, Buzz? What we're going to do is if you go on Instagram, upload your favorite bail of you falling, and uh, a Volcom team rider is going to pick the winner, and you're going to get a Volcom package and a bomb hole package. But what you got to do is hashtag Volcom bomb proof on your bail, and we will pick the winners, and you will get a little prize pack. All right. Uh, we've been cruising along for a little bit, but one thing that we I think we should talk about is potentially your food choices. I know you're a vegan, and why do you choose to be vegan, and why is that important to you? I guess it's kind of, it was like a transition, you know. My sister was the first person I ever saw just become vegetarian. It was because she was just going traveling to India and she had to do it kind of as recommended or whatever to like not eat foreign meats and all that over there. And that was where I was like, oh, well, you can, you know, not eat meat. And then my other friend Dubbers, he got like kind of put onto it uh, and just like that, he just like did it. And I remember being super curious, always asking him questions like, what do you do for, you know, egg substitute or like these other things to, you know, baking, and cooking. But uh, so I was always curious. I've always loved animals, like just big, just like animal lover all growing up. So 
as soon as I kind of found out that like you don't have to, like I thought it was gonna be like, okay, if you don't, you're gonna be taking like this vitamin and this supplement and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm not trying to do all that. But yeah, the more I found out, the more it was just like trying it here and there. And as soon as I kind of was like home cooking where you're like, you know, taking care of yourself, I was like, I'd rather not buy meat. And I hated cleaning up after I hated cutting the fat off of chicken or cleaning grease off a pan. But when I met my girlfriend, she had already been vegan for several years. And so that was kind of like one of our like bonding things was like making meals together. And then she kind of like showed me like good meals and would always like love cooking things. And for me, it was like the harder part was like that, like knowing what to make and like how to like have full meals still. And yeah, she just really got me into it. And it was an easy switch for me in the sense of, like, I didn't want to eat animals, like, if I don't have to. And uh, as soon as, like, yeah, I found out that you can do that, it was, like, all in. And then the more I found out, it was almost like once I became vegan, then I started seeing some of those documentaries and things talking about, like, the health benefits to it or, like, the environmental impacts to it. And the more I was finding out, I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm so grateful that I can, like, be doing this and still be help. not only like survive like this is probably healthier for me in the long run for like longevity and like healing quicker and so many benefits it was one of those things that like once the doors opened it just kept like revealing more and more things and i'd say that's like the bottom line is knowing that like you don't have to then i'm not going to i grew up where it was like you need your food group you need to get the whole, I was a tiny little person, so my mom was always like, you know, you got to eat good so you can grow, you know, and uh, yeah, uh, that's kind of my take on it. When did you become vegan? It's like six years ago now, because like as long as I've been with my girlfriend, pretty much, that was a transition, and a lot easier to like have another person to do it with. It'd be tough if only one of you did it. And right, right, and just when it comes meat, to like, she wouldn't be. yeah, and just when it comes to like grocery shopping and all that, like. And two, when I was two in my other situations, group living, traveling on the road, like someone makes a dinner, you know, beggars can't be choosers. You kind of like eat what's there. And even in my first transition, that's kind of how it went. You're at a family dinner and you like don't want to turn down a meal. Like, but eventually I was like, no, I'm just, I'd rather not cut it out. But uh, yeah, it's definitely like to me become one of the, like, most important things i like want to share it more but it definitely because the stigma like you don't want to try to like shove it down people's throats and i'm always second guessing on even like posting things or whatever but like i commend people that do i see that like sage does you know and max warbington i was like hyped when i heard them like talk about it too because it really is that type of thing it's like thank you you know i think the thing to be shared is what good meals there are because a lot of people think Amazing. like oh what am i going to eat then my wife and i tried it for a little bit one summer and it's crazy if you grab a vegan right. cookbook and just go nuts yeah yeah that was the thing too like kind of like our initial like getting together it was like every time we made up it'd be like to make a dinner from scratch how do we make a burger or tacos that's the thing now it's like i eat the same things pizza burger taco breakfast sandwiches but just the vegan version of it and uh What's your vegan go-to when you get, like, a vegan meat? Like, there's a couple breakfast sausage things that I really like because, like, I never even really like sausage that much, but it's a very easy one to transition. Uh, fake meats, I mean, it's definitely one of those ones, too, you realize from those learning from it is, like, ideally you want to just, like, real food, real veggies and everything, but obviously, yeah, I, like, different burgers like, yeah like the beyond ones. i do eat the those. beyond ones they are like they give you that feel of, like if you're grilling like, it feels like a true one but i almost Grill like with the, the ones more that yeah it it's almost feels more i like the ones where you can see the veggies and everything yeah, yeah. in it rather than just some chemical mix up but i true i appreciate it for getting like a the feeling of like cooking out and burger but uh and also there was a situation where it kind of uh, expose some allergies or you notice you had some, al you were yeah. some allergies. It's stuff. curious. Like I get curious about like what, if there's any correlation, but like around the same time, um, like I've also had like a gluten allergy. And then I always wonder that even too, how I even found out about it. I started getting these like allergic reactions in my face, like just red skin coming up and 
Um, Zach's mom, Zach Lefter's mom, was studying Ayurvedic medicine, so she kind of, like, gave me her take on it of, like, she did this whole, like, survey kind of, like, on my food I eat and my lifestyle, this. And her take was, like, okay, favor these type of food and try to cut out these type of food. More, like, I want to go for more, like, you know, simple taste and avoid, like, spicy and oily things. And then her husband at the time was, like, a western medicine doctor and he saw my face and was just like oh uh, i've seen people cure that with going gluten-free like and i never even really thought about like gluten-free i didn't know what it meant and it was basically from finding like wheat and cutting out like wheat so bread and pasta and i lived off that stuff like that was my go-to get a loaf of bread make a pasta it's cheap everyone yeah, knows that cheap. cheap so like that <laughs> when you're like living that lifestyle is so part of me thinks I was like, maybe I overdid it with the wheat, you know, and like, so if anything, like going vegan too, like people think, oh, what are you going to eat? Like it expanded my food so much, so much more variety now. I'm actually getting like different veggies and, and then, uh, mushrooms too became like a much bigger part. That was something to kind of realizing once you stop eating meat, you like kind of crave certain things. And then you feel like, okay, what you get from mushrooms definitely feels like a different type of nutrients compared to just fruits and veggies. And uh, and they definitely do. It's even thing, too, like mushrooms are more closely related to, like, meat than they are to veggies, like the actual compound. Yeah, they, they also, I know they, they process vitamin D and turn it into energy the same way a human does. Right, right. When right. like, plants, plants don't do that. Yeah, like some, there's That's like crazy. those parts of it. Yeah, they're almost closer to being like a ma- animal. And yeah, but uh, portobello mushroom burger. Mm, yeah, right. That's, that's the jam right there. Yeah, so yeah, I definitely expanded my food, just variety. And I feel like I probably do get a lot more nutrients in now. I had a question too. When you switched, did you notice a change in energy or vitality? Or did you have any like, like kind of light bulb going off? Like, wow, I feel better than I did before. Definitely just in, like, uh, emotional level. It's, like, hard to really explain, but, like, you... It's more just that, like, soul feeling of, like, I feel good about this, you know what I mean? Especially from the angle of, like, I love animals, you know? And, like you're saying, some of those documentaries, I mean, you get all the sides of it, but when you see that gnarly shit, like, the, the, the bad shit, the slaughterhouses, yeah. Yeah. like... Yeah, that stuff's hard to watch. That shit hits my core. And if I can, like, not be a part of that, like... Thank you. I'm glad I don't have to. You yeah. know, like mm-hmm. I thought, you, you know, you think you kind of have to, but like you don't. And now I'm six years deep. My physical body is probably the best it's ever been. I feel like, like I'm 30 now. I don't feel 30 at all. <laughs> like, I don't that's know if that's part of it. Because you're always a fucking baby. Yeah. Like, it's what? crazy. <laughs> it's crazy yeah. to even like say it loud, but like, yeah, I physically, like, my body feels good, you know, I don't. And, like, what do you learn, too? Did you see that one, Game Changers? I don't think so, no. Oh, really? Because I remember you mentioned in one of your other ones, you'd, like, seen some of the documentaries. I've watched some. I don't remember the names. It might be. So if you saw Game Changers, I feel like that would be one that would kind of, like, stick with you. It's a lot more about, like, athletes and people who have gone vegan and talking about their, like, physical change from it, and it's pretty fascinating, like, whether it be, like, bodybuilders or just athletes, like, healing from injuries to hear their, like, take on, like, noticing the Mm -hmm. benefits, or it'd be, like, someone who's been doing this, you know, certain sport for so many years that then went vegan, and all of a sudden their, like, increase Mm -hmm. is, like, whoa. You know, it's cool to see that side. Definitely, of it. the thing thinking about it, it's I admire the hell out of it, and I think it's awesome. But the way society's set up, the commitment or whatever to it is like you're like, fuck, it's hungry. I'm hungry. Like, shit, I can just pull in and get a burger real quick, and yeah. like, or you're on the road, and and like that commitment to be like, no, nah, well, I'm gonna go to the grocery store and make sure we have what we need, or right, like right. traveling. You know, it's 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 just. Out of sheer convenience, and I'm not proud of that. I just haven't, I haven't made a commitment to, and and I also, I have a different perspective on on certain things because I have, I I back hunting, which is is totally <coughs> understandable why people don't too. But that type of meat eating, I I believe in. But what's your take? Because I'm I'm open yeah. to like uh, that. Well, conversation. definitely hearing uh, 
Carter's like take on it with like his and like that. Everyone's kind of like a product of their environment. Yeah, grow up with it and hearing it says so like, I have respect for that, and I totally understand if that's where yep. you're raised. Like, that's your world to it, and you think people in that sense where they like care about the soil, you know, care about the well being of these animals, like. I can understand with that. And uh, like you're saying, in modern society, it's almost like hard to imagine like the way we've kind of got everything to with cities. Like, is it even possible to do that, feed people on that scale? But that is the type of thing I like look into. And there's people who are like, you know, this is their life. Is, and they they seem to have answers. You know, I don't personally have it all to tell right now, but like there are answers and solutions. And definitely the system we have going is not working. Yeah, we're on a bad trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea of, like, if everyone just hunted, that apparently wouldn't really work with how many people we have that's and just how the food we have. But um, That's a good point. It, you know, there could be a balance in it. And, like, there's definitely the takes on, like, you know, indigenous cultures who have their way of doing it. So it's, like, I can I be open to other people's takes on it, but it's kind of, like, where we are, too, this day and age. Like, we, we are able to do the switch like the food is out there and like with the restaurants it is hard traveling but like you see there's more and more like come to the city like salt lake and there's a bunch of vegan restaurants which is awesome to see and that's all fairly new the hardest part too is like traveling and being in social settings that like weird Mm -hmm. feeling you know we go out to a big dinner and i gotta like order something different and ask a little extra question and like it makes you uncomfortable and I could feel how, like, for some people, that alone it makes it so much harder to do the transition just because social pressure, mm-hmm. family, family events. But, like, once you do and, like, you kind of have it in your heart of, like, why, you know, it's, like, it feels really good to kind of, like, hold your ground on that. And then, yeah, it's it's really made me, like, too, you know just want to focus on learning to grow my own food you know and like working towards like researching like what are the systems that people are doing to like grow abundant gardens that aren't like just one big monocrop field to fill up a grocery store so it's like it's shaped my it's like I don't even know which came first I kind of got into the idea of growing and that almost led me to go vegan too because of the idea of like feeling like the whole system like this isn't working you're finding out all these problems and i'm like okay where can i like start to fix some things or personally so it was almost like okay if you can grow your own food then you're not reliant on that food system and then i'm like okay if i'm growing my own food i never really thought to like raise livestock to eat and that might just because of like that just didn't ever come into my picture so then it was all of a sudden you think about going vegan and i was like okay just try to grow the food that you're gonna eat you know take care of yourself in that way and they they go hand in hand it's this idea of trying to be more self-reliant to not be so reliant on the system just will add right into becoming vegan and uh just trying to grow i think food. that's that's really wise words too because it's there's this overwhelming thing that happens where you're like this shit's all set up like if i if i eat this is my own thought process, right? If I, me changing my eating patterns is not going to make a fucking difference or whatever, right? Like it's, you, you're like, this shit's fucked either way, right? That's what, that's what maybe the realist in me goes, but that's necessarily not the, the right way of thinking because it's, you know, we had Russell Winfield on and he had, and we've mentioned the quote before, but you know, how do you change the world? We were talking about, this is as it pertains, I think to like racism, but it also applies to this, but you know, how do you, how do you make the world a better place? Well, it, be a better person, you know. If I'm a better person and you're a better person and you're a better person, then and each person's focused on being a better person. Well, then collectively we're doing the right thing. And and the same thing you could take that same thing and apply it to like dietary restraints, you know. Right. You know. And kind of like that. At the end of the day, you can only do your part. You can only work on yourself. And yep. when those problems start to get so overwhelming, it's literally just start like chipping away any little piece you can, and that one, like I said, it kind of just opened up so many doors once I, like, did start trying. And you're like, wow, this is really, like, beneficial in more ways than I, I realize. And, yeah, trying. Like, we, like, you do what you can in your own lane and try. And uh, that, to me, has become probably one of the most important things of just, like, step step in the right direction kind mm-hmm. of thing, you know. 
the environmental impact side of it too like now that we know like obviously global warming and just like environmental damage is such like a big thing that seems to be more and more coming in the realm it's like this could really be like change if everyone kind of caught on board in like a bigger way like it could do a lot of change like rapidly almost like when COVID happened and we're seeing all these big changes because the way it changed everyone's like living i i feel we really could make like quite the transition faster than people want to like give credit to just by that one thing of switching the way we eat and it's not going to happen like overnight but i think we all should pay attention to it a little bit more and definitely like yeah carter was talking about the food system it's like it's a big you know part of it you know and that's it's crazy because like that like in relation to like the snowboarding and everything it's like we're just trying to like keep it going I want to keep it going, but then, like, you get so in that world, but then, like, the other side that balances it of, like, you got to eat food at the end of the day, and you got to have a roof over your head. So it's, like, trying to get these things set up so I can keep doing just the snowboarding mm -hmm. stuff that you love so much. But And also, that's uh, the overwhelming issues that are so unfathomable how to solve. Just do your part, and that's, mm -hmm. a, that's such a good point. And I think it's really cool how you take – Mark Carter, you keep referencing our, our podcast with Mark Carter. Mark Carter is he he's uh, a cowboy. He he herds cattle and he gathers them up and you know, he has Carter Country meats. And it's interesting how sometimes you guys almost seem like even though you guys care even though he comes from the meat side of things and you're more on the vegetarian vegan side of things, your guys' al views align probably more than right. Maybe, yeah. maybe just the person that goes and eats, uh, like myself, who's guilty of going to a fucking burger shop and just ordering a burger. Yeah, it was pretty cool for me to hear his. And, like, like I was telling you, it was, like, the first few minutes into it, it was almost, like, turned off just hearing about, like, cattle ranching, you know? But then I kept listening, and it was, like, such proof of, like, you got to, like, hear people out. Because, like you're saying, he really, to hear him go into, like, soil health and, like, carrying, like, put, shining light on that, like, the food system's really messed up. It really was like, yeah, I'm uh, just so happy to hear that he cared about that and brought that into the attention. And yeah, there there's no one answer. You know, the way I am with vegan, I'm happy personally that I've been able to survive like this and it feels good for me. But like, I, I don't know enough to say that this is what everyone should do. You know, like, I, you know, I hope we can find a way to mesh it all, you know, but um, so, yeah, yeah, we got we got to like all kind of like just like with this the podcast to talk about things like we do things it's like that's something i want to talk about in the general conversation of like interacting with other humans can we try to work on some answers here we need yeah, to just group talk more there. right yeah. the population's growing and we're running out of space yeah. for either cattle or crops so right. people got to figure things some things out or we're going to be in right. trouble in the future yeah, and the food system we have going is, like, depleting water. It's ruining the soil. And uh, there is science behind other methods of doing it, but they don't necessarily, like, it's like that when it comes back to money and profits and the systems we have set up. It's like it doesn't just happen. Yeah, yeah. They don't all align, right, the, yeah. the making money parts and then doing it proper. Yeah, you have the, the big the pharmaceutical companies and you have also the big um, glyphosate companies and and they're just too big to it they're just there's too much profits to be had to, yeah it's, right it's an uphill battle and that's that why stuff. too like i don't know i just clicked in my head but i always think about it so like you know our green bandit production started out as just like little middle school gang but as like our everything shifted and we started caring about more of these like environmental issues and everything and the fact that those systems are so in place that they almost make it hard for you to live off grid and grow your own food and collect water. That's like not even allowed. I was like, oh, we're almost like the green bandits of the sense of like trying to do things the green way is almost like outlawed these days. Yeah, you know that's well said. Yeah. yeah, it was just like a cool little thing. Kind of came around full yeah, circle. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. And then I think it's, there's something there with the with the mushrooms too, because I know you guys love, you like mushrooms as a food source. They're just like, yeah. they're full of great i think proteins i'm pretty it's sure a bit, yeah and it's very much the thing of like what i was saying about the vegan stuff it's like once you open that door it just kind of like keeps going of all this stuff you didn't realize and mushrooms was one that like 
it started with like first time psychedelic experience and it was just like so life changing and like amazing in the sense of like, wow, like it, this is so not what I thought from like what society teaches you growing up and everything, you know? And, um, just really appreciated that. And that kind of just caught like a little like interest and all of a sudden I'm like drawing it. And then I was like more open to try different. I didn't even like mushrooms when they'd be like in a soup or in a veggie dish. I'd kind of like push those to the side. But then after that, I was like, oh, I like mushrooms. I kind of like them. And then, and then you start to see there's so many more variety of them. Um, yeah, there's then, so many mushrooms. Right? Yeah, and then you see, like, the different, um, you know, nutritional benefits of it. And like I was saying, once you cut out meat, you realize, like, there's definitely something in mushrooms that it's, like, feels good to get in to get the balance. And then, so, yeah, once I started getting into it more and just kind of, like, putting in drawings and just, like, um, I saw this TED talk called six ways mushrooms can save the world. And I definitely recommend it to anyone to just like check it out and type that in. I love TED talks, you know, mm -hmm. ideas were spreading. And, uh, so it's this dude, Paul Stamets, and he just lays out like all these like six different potential ways that like they can make serious change, whether it be like with the food system, environmental waste, like cleanup or soil regeneration or medicinal uses and after seeing that, it was like, whoa, there's like, there's like a, so much more to this. Like, I just thought it was kind of cool, but like now I have so much reason to love them. Like really love them, you know, and not just on the psychedelic part. Like mm -hmm. there's like a wide range of things these could be helping. So like, yeah, just got into it and kind of like seeing more. And then I started like listening to podcasts about mushrooms in uh, the Mushroom Hour podcast. Another really good one. It's like these are my two bomb hole and mushroom hour. Nice. And that one too. It's like it's not just talk about mushrooms. It's like the people involved in that world are very like environmentally conscious and have are coming up with solutions to help. Like in that area of like yeah, we can always talk about all the negative, but I'm almost like ah stop. Like I want solutions we can talk about mm -hmm. so we can you know. And then in that realm, there's more solutions than a lot of other things that are promising and. So basically, there's, it's this company like Meaty, but more or less they're making mushroom mycelium that they can then manipulate into being like a fake meat. And then the process in which they do that is very scalable. So like their longer vision of it is this could really be the type of thing where you could bring to like a third world country, create these things because it's like a controlled environment and make more or less a very nutritional food source in areas that could be like a food desert when it comes to like growing veggies wow. and all these things. So certain things like that that are just like just promising visions of where this could go, you know. And then on the medicinal side, you know, mushrooms have been used in ancient Chinese medicine for so long as like, you know, these really powerful, you know, whether it be for cancer or just across the board medicinally. Yep. And lion's mane, you lion's mane micro dosing tail. for uh, depressing, depression. Yeah. And, and then like, like that, like bring it all back to like that, how psychedelics are kind of what originally got me like sparked into it. I mean, that's like just a whole nother conversation of the potential of what that can of opening your mind. Yeah. <laughs> and just like, how could that really like on like a society type of, how could that impact our society in and denver made it legal right or I, other yeah. places and that's maybe. like too like yeah. just keeping my eye on that it's like it's really cool but interesting too because same with like you know the ups and downs of it it's like do you just make it legal like that's kind of a big thing right now does it be just legal and like turn into a giant monopoly of like how the cannabis industry and then there's all these big names and then they just push everyone out and mm -hmm. So they're very trying to, like, do this in a smart way to, like, how can we, like, get it to people but also have, like, the right settings for it to be the good impact, you know what I mean? They used properly. Yeah, and, like, and just to not be so controlled by, like, some, met, like, um, pharmaceutical yeah, company. Yeah, giant feel, company. You know? But, that's yeah, that's just profits. another area. And uh, there's a really good documentary called Fantastic Fungi that came out in the past, like, year and another one I'd really recommend to people. It's like, it will explain a lot more of like, I wish I could fully get out, but like, it's an up to date current documentary that really explains a lot. And it comes back to all the potential of psychedelics and how that can, you know, it could be like a huge help for all of us to uh, 
start working on some of these issues. That's there, cool. I'll link all that stuff in the show notes. Sweet. Everything it's you mentioned. A book I read too. I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called Stealing Fire or something like that. It's by the same author that does all the flow state stuff. Totally spacing on his name, but it's about uh, psychedelics. And there's a couple things where they talk about uh, war vets with PTSD using, I think it's MDMA to like cure that. But then mm-hmm. one I thought was cool was... Uh, talking about big CEOs, they're talking about big CEOs and a lot of these, these big CEOs, when you're running a big company, what do you, what do you need? You're, you're doing problem solving essentially. What do you, what do you need for problem solving? Well, it's creativity. Well, how do you tap into creativity? And so they're kind of, they're like all these like fortune 500 CEOs that are micro dosing to try to expand their creativity so they can Right. Think Before outside the box. Think outside think, the box. Yeah, exactly. Like new right. ideas that are going to make a change and help right. the company Just expand. thinking or, differently. That's kind of like one of the eye-opening things to it is it like really can like open up your perspective mm-hmm. on like, whoa, you can see things from a different angle. And the part I like about when they talk about it being used for like PTSD is they talk about it's kind of like versus the normal antidepressants kind of just like you know, pushed back the bad feelings, numb out, numb it out, and just kind of like, yeah, do that. But like, what the psychedelic version of tr- trying to like deal with PTSD is like, you still have the same issues and problems, but it helps you kind of just look at it from a different point of view and just like change your story on how you were like affected by that. So like, I don't know. That's just super interesting to me. And you like, don't dull out the the stuff going on in your yeah, mind but you actually just, like well just the the whole thing about like point of view it. you know what i mean yeah. that was where like the, you know see the the flux binding i did with the mushrooms on it and it says there's a quote on the back and it says everything is perfect it all depends on how you look at it perspective mm. and it's just all about perspective and that was kind of too like an experience i had with mushrooms where just like just because of the state i was in it was like everything was perfect and it's kind of like that too, just looking at like the plus and minuses of, you know, ups and downs of everything. And if you can just shape your point of view to like learn from the negative thing that happens to you or like whatever, take that all. It's like, yeah, perspective is just like a really cool thing to just kind of like be able to like switch around and not just be so locked in on like, this is life, this is reality, like. Mm-hmm. It's I love that topic. Yeah, that's it's great. it's fascinating too. And and the book I'm reading on, I might have brought this up in another episode. I apologize if I'm if I'm re- repeating myself, yeah. but uh, you know the 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 way they explain this this exact topic is like things aren't good or bad. They they just happen. That's your reaction to them. You know we we have these preconceived notions that things are good or bad. Oh my my girlfriend left me. That that's bad. That's a bad thing. This and then you tell yourself a story, and that's your perspective and. Mm-hmm. And and it's really like that's just your reaction to it, right. you know. And it's so funny. Maybe especially you're going to meet a better girlfriend and, and you, be much happier. And then right? yeah. when yeah. you get some time and distance from it, anytime you go through a fucking hardship, you get some space from it. You're like, I'm so you know, if you're if you framed it up right, Jen, you're in a good space. Right. You're you're going to say that was, I'm that was the best thing that ever happened to me. All those all those hardships. And then when you, but then the unhealthy space is the story you tell yourself surrounding it that this is. You know, it's just our stories surrounding this situation that we right. tell ourselves. They're not real. Our thoughts aren't real. And you aren't have real. the option to, like, switch it up. You yeah. Know? There's a book I read uh, years ago that was called Zen and the Art of Happiness. Mm-hmm. I've read that book. Yeah. It's really, really good. Yeah. That one, like, really, too, like we were talking earlier about, like, uh, just, you know, things, the most important impacts, like, you know, sayings or whatever. But that book, like, it's all about that, like, and they tell stories and go into it and basically like how you can always take a situation and like make it into a good thing. And yeah, I took that with me for the rest of my life and it's not always like easy. Sometimes you're like really trying to be like, you know, someone died or like, you know, accident happens. You're like, how could this possibly be for good? But you can't, there's ways, you know, you just, shape it around and just like really think about what you took from it and like you can you can always turn it into like a positive thing because you're always learning from it you learn from it it's always like thinking like you ride the highs you learn from the lows you know you're just always learning it's a good perspective yeah i mean th- well we're as we're talking this is this is my favorite 
thing to talk about because I think that sometimes those those worst things that happen to you end up being the things that that change your perspective. You losing mm. somebody close, losing a family member, realizing what's important, and and it's so funny. Also talking about reading these books, I love this this topic too because I can I can read books. Let's say we're talking about what we're kind of talking about negativity, right? You can be like, oh, this person always frames this thing negatively or this, you know, and, and, and then it's like, but can you, can you read it as it pertains to yourself too? I always find that super mm. interesting. Like it's, you can always point the finger, but then I have to read it and be oh, like, oh right. yeah, I do that too. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. cause you can be like, and, and it's, it's interesting with the people that are negative when you, you spend time around them, you it's like, it's things don't always, they almost have like a, bad luck follows them around. It's like bad luck just seems to just follow these people around. Then right. the people that are just wildly positive and, and are doing radiating good energy. It's like, fuck, it just seems like things just keep going this guy's way, even when they don't. Right. And, right. And yeah, it's kind of hard to, when you see and like, yeah, I'll fall back into it. Even when you like, know not to but like you're mm -hmm. saying, just even with the depression or anything, it's like, it's so hard to like move yourself out of it when you're in it. But like, Sometimes when you see people from the outside perspective, you want to just like tell them like, yo, like mm -hmm. you're, you're bringing that on to yourself by like being negative like that, you know, but mm -hmm. it's not always easy or like that. Maybe it's not even your place to ever say, you know, but like it is crazy when you mm -hmm. kind of like see it in real life. And that also too is just like, you know, that realization when you can kind of see it and just learn from it. Like, okay, reminder, like that's proof you, mm -hmm. you, let out negative look what happened mm -hmm. you know what i mean you never want to be like i told you so but like you see the shit go down 100 and if you don't believe it's real like that the energy fields and all those things like look at a dog a dog can tell when you're sad you're in a yeah. bad mood you're feeling a type of way they got their tail between their legs you didn't say a single thing yeah you didn't say a single thing you just be sit there boiling they know yeah you're gonna tell me that the energy you radiates not real you're fucking out of your mind right dude. And so when you walk around and you radiate that good energy and you get around other people like that, it just brings up, it just raises that whole, yeah, that whole energy level. And, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. You just try to find ways to like stay in that mode. Cause that's kind of the thing too. I feel like I've had times on such good, good, good dreams coming true, like all this. And then when it starts to go down, it like hits you super hard cause you notice it so much. And you like know you you either like you know we're laying into a bad energy and then now you're like feeling the effects and how do you build yourself back up from it and like yeah it can hit really hard when you feel like you can tell things aren't aligning and you're not on like a good vibe it's just like it hits so hard because mm -hmm. you're like oh, I know I know this should be like. But I'm in it. You know? It's hard to see when you're in it. It's hard yeah. to see. It's hard to see anything else. But when you're in that that wave, I love Jess Kimura likens it to a wave. Mm -hmm. She's like the the wave's gonna be good. You're gonna catch it, and then you're gonna get held under. But it's gonna go in. It's gonna go out. Yeah. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be bad. But one of the things that's helped me in any time I've been in a dark situation and dealing with any type of issue is I'm I'm always just like one year from now, this issue is not gonna be the issue it is today. Right. And I and every single time I've said that, it's come true. I'm like, oh, I, mean, I haven't even fucking, I haven't even think about that. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And definitely, too, I like think back on, like, one that I took away from Eddie Wall's episode when he talks about, like, just the extremes, you know? And he had that guidance counselor who told him, like, try to just find more balance. Like, don't be so excited because then you'll just be so down afterwards, mm -hmm. you know? And even... uh Dylan Alito, when he was talking about Jaeger and kind of like extreme highs, extreme lows. And I feel like hearing Eddie Wall say that has helped me. And that was recent, you know, and I'm now taking that into my life because I was on this feeling of like just relating more and more to like the yin yang and like, you know, the balance. And you try to like, you know, like when you're in the negatives, you'll trust, okay, like good times are coming, you know, or something, you know, like to not get so down, but like, the way he put that to try to find more of like a level playing field. Cause I'm like, I've been chasing, you know, that good feelings, like all good, fucking happy manifesting dreams, good stuff. And then you get in the low and it just feels so low. And I'm like, damn, am I like, 
putting myself so low because I'm chasing these so high highs. Um, and then there's been times where I'm like, fuck, I need to just be like a monk, you know, and just have more of like a level playing field and I won't feel these extreme lows. And then, yeah, shit like Jaeger, like it trips me out. I had another friend in the same year took his life and he was one of like the happiest, amazing people I've ever met. And I feel like I kind of like, you know, I'm like very happy in this and that. But then it's always that thing like people not realize like that the reverse side of that is like super negative too. And like you're saying, the self critic is almost you're like hardest on yourself. So it's like shit's hard when it gets hard, you know. The flip side of it. So yeah, that was, I think Eddie's that's, shit was super that, meaningful for me to hear totally. that. And, and, and that's such a common thing with people that love action sports because it's like yeah, you exactly. you're like I'm gonna <laughs> strap in and fucking scare the shit out of myself and chuck on like a 70 foot kicker right and then uh, and that, that just, like up it's and so you're just like up. and you land something that you're just so you had to scare yourself to get there you're flying through the air or you're doing some dangerous trick on a rail and you're just you're just riding high the, uh, the highs of somebody that's doing like really high level snowboarding tricks is is maybe higher than the average right. person right and it's and then it's you the like, same as whacking a line of drugs. Like you're gonna go up when you whack a line a line of cocaine, you're gonna come right fucking back right. down too. And know? then like that, you get the extreme up from sending out some shit, but then you like hurt your knee, and now you're dealing with the life battle of like, am I gonna be able to do anything again? Mm -hmm. What is my life gonna be uh, without any of this, you know, sports stuff at all? So it's like you know, yeah, the extremes and just trying to, well, and and there's even more. There's even a more. Uh, there's even a more deeper la level I'll get into too. Is you really look at, you know, professional athletes. When I look at at, um, you know, the, where where it's at is where a lot of the drive comes from. For I'm not gonna say for everybody, but for I, I'll speak on myself as a younger rider. Like, you, I was really insecure, right? And and my my way of like getting validation was through tricks. Like, Oh man, I did this cool trick. I got validation. People like me and they're, I have a mm. sponsor and whatever, you know? And, and so, but like really you're like deep down, there's like a lot of like, sometimes there's like self hatred driving the tricks. You're just like, you're so discontent with yourself that your one way to get validation is through, through tricks like like the self-hatred dri can drive like somebody to be the best whereas if mm. you if you take somebody that has take inner peace to me the highest level of frequency you can radiate is, is peace that's the highest level of aside from enlightenment it's higher than love it's higher than love like i don't know what else you want to say so if you're in a place of peace you don't give a shit if you land a 900 or not. You're just good. You're like, right. I could, but I'm good. So it's an interesting one because I, when I look at a lot of pro athletes and I go fucking Dr. Phil psychologist on them, a lot of the, a lot of the reason, the drive to be the best comes from a deep insecurity or, you know? And so right. once you, once you kind of like purge through some of that, who gives a shit if you're good or not, <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. A lot of like that, like you're, you know, you've said it in a bunch of the other ones. You say out, it's just even like the self worth, self worth feel from like yep. getting the shit. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it really has been like a never ending thing. Just trying to like feel a part of the mix, feel a part of the group, and like you know, that's how I would make my place. That's why I'd go that hard, just because I want to like be in the mix with everyone. And if I didn't have that, what would I even mm -hmm. have friends? You know, or like what would it be? Yeah, definitely, you know, and even times like today, you know, then events and shit like that too, contests used to be so stressful in that way, you know what I mean? You put so much on the line just to like in your inside building up what this is and what this could be. And now, you know, coming back to events like Lucas's and just being around fans, it's so much more like, no, just being here mm -hmm. and like just whatever, like any of this is all good, you know, like, mm -hmm. Stoked, yeah. I just did some further reading. When you talked about peace and frequencies, I at first thought you meant like peace as in people getting along. But you mean inner like peace. being content. I mean inner and, peace, and being content. Like, yeah, like, like kind of. Like I'm, I'm good with it. I'm good. I don't care. I'm if okay. I do that trick or this, I'm, I'm at peace. Inner so I, peace. I kind of took that wrong at first when you said that. Yeah. And that's something too, like if you feel that feeling of what that is, like try to like hone in on like, okay, what, what does that? Like if you get a little glimpse of like, I feel at peace. Mm -hmm. Try to like soak it in and feel that. And what made you feel so that? So yes, yeah, so then yeah. you can kind of like, 
figure out how to carry that on more. It's like that. the grandfather watching the family and just being right. hanging out with mm-hmm. everybody. And that's and honestly that one love. thing I'd say for mushrooms was like one of those things that you just take away from it all. You get that glimpse of like fully content, grateful, happy, feel good. And then you could just take that away of like, okay, I, I know what that feels like. Mm-hmm. How do I, how did I get there? Yeah. And how can I just kind of shape that in your everyday perspective mm-hmm. you know just because like once you know like yeah you can just feel content well and and you're also you're also bypassing a lot of the other you're also bypassing a lot of these like misconceptions societally because i think that what where where does society kind of say that we are the most it's when we're the best at something it's kind of beaten into you look at oh i want to be fucking michael jordan or i want to be the best or in my experience is the best I've ever done on my snowboard was with the most miserable I've been that shortly after I didn't, the, the, the level of success on a, on a snowboard did not in any way relate to my happiness. Like, sure. I was able to feed myself and financially that was great. And, but was I any happier? Fuck no. You know? And so, all right, well I tried that. That doesn't work. What's, how do I feel content and happy? And, yeah. and, and it's like, you know, that if you're, if you're chasing, balance and inner peace i think that that's like the black belt move when you see the old gr- grandpa on the couch watching his kids like he's just right. happy you know yeah. and that's what too like you're saying pays to like you got but we're able to pay the bills you gotta pay the bills. Yeah. And i mean that's so much what for me like the idea of trying to set up your home base to be able to take care of yourself it's like if you can have that taken care of that's where it'd be so much easier to feel at peace like it was kind of like the thing of like when bills would come around, whether it be like my parents or the first year we're all living in a house together paying rents, like you see arguments come up around bills. Mm-hmm. It's one of the only times like that that energy comes out, you know? So it was like trying to find a way to get away from like that need to make the bills. You got to go do this thing to do that, to do that. It's like, so it's just looking for a way to like, yeah, get away from that to feel more just at mm-hmm. peace. And if it's like, you know, like the Maslow human needs of like, I don't know that it's a Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. And it more or less goes along the lines of like, you know, you know, you need a roof over your head, a meal, you know, just the basic needs. And uh, yeah, it's just a matter of that. If you can get that stuff, just like taking care of it's mm-hmm. so much easier to be less, you know, anxious about how you're gonna i think that's so true i was watching a podcast or no i was watching a day in the life or something with andrew reynolds and he's like i've just been working on like simplifying my life and i admire that so much because it does feel like so hectic and overwhelming i gotta pay my bills and go grocery shopping and do my to-do list and Mm -hmm. it's like this this rat race and and i admire you know people like yourself or Reynolds who keep it simple. It's like, you know, boil it down to yeah. just simplify it, you know, and the and gratitude. Yeah. Just, that's what like makes it go around. Like, yeah, I've definitely been simplifying like that times now. I feel like I've been so out of the loop of like going out to film, traveling this and that, and like grateful to like end up in Tahoe. But like, that's, I can just go outside there and just like, look at its surroundings and be happy and just like the simpleness of that you know being in nature too like mm-hmm. the land i'll be down at the land no service no power no one i'll be down there alone and it's some of my most happy and comfortable places mm-hmm. i've ever been because you're just like you just yeah in awe of it nature and just content I just looked up that maslow's hierarchy of human needs and that's pretty tight it kind of is along the frequency line and it's just kind of a pyramid built up of of the basic needs of a human and it starts with like your basic physio physiological needs like air water food shelter and then goes into feeling safe and then feeling loved and then esteem which is respect and and self-esteem and status but the top is really just that self-actualization of uh, being the the best you can be and the most you can be and reaching that at peace and it really like the part about like feeling safe, like kind of like showing that like, yeah, really the fact of feeling safe is like so important, you know? And that's true. Yeah. For, Cause if a lot of people, they don't feel safe, they're like, they're wigging out. Yeah. And that's people what cause people that. to do, you know, crazy things mm-hmm. or whatever. But like, yeah, you just want to feel safe. <laughs> like that's insane. Yeah. It gets you a partner that helps you do that too. That, yeah, that helps true. a lot. Yeah. Man. 
I like that. This is a, we've gotten deep. We've gone deep. Yeah, we turned a good and I and I like it how it's could go deep. It's my favorite conversations. We can go deep. Yeah, that's what was cool too. The times with that group, you know, everyone's partiers, all this and that. But like some of those conversations in the big group house or on the bus, everyone gets really deep, and that's why I'm so close with all those friends. You, yeah, you know? get those minds all together, right? Yeah, and like that, like yeah, like we'll all be out with other people and this and that. But when it's actually just like the core crew and like, we're trying to work out some stuff like that. Like everyone's pretty, pretty deep. And you all know each other so well. You yeah. Can, and that makes the bond deeper, so strong, yeah, you know, and that's level. why now like you can go time away and meet back up and it's just like right back yeah. there. I have another Patreon question. I should have asked when we were talking about Japan, but I don't want to forget it. So I'm going to throw it in. This is from John Martin. Do you have any Ryuki Ogawa stories? Yeah, John Martin. I love seeing his shit. Like, just so, like, skate. You know, you can see his passion for skating. Um, I've never met him, though, I don't think. But, yeah. And Ryuki, like, yeah. See, oh, two just, like, traveling and, like, meeting different people from around the world. That's definitely, like, become like one of my greatest things i'm so grateful for with snowboarding and skateboarding the people i've been able to meet and like that it really does go into kind of like yeah you have a fun day snowboarding on the streets but then when you get that after time to kick it and like get those real conversations that's what like secures the bond and there was time is during to that kazu contest i went out for and ryuki and masato like around my age, maybe a little younger, and they're more or less like, you should stay another week so we can go film some street stuff. So I got to just straight like jump in on their like way of living in Japan. And a lot of the other times I'd go, it'd be like on a trip that's set up and you got to do this, this, and this. And this was one of my first times just like there with them. It was super cool. Like even times, you know, like they'd fully be in conversation in Japanese and like almost like forget I was there. And that was, like, the coolest feeling to feel, you know? But, yeah, those guys are hilarious. Masato and Ryuki are, like, two of my favorite people to watch snowboard, like, 100%. Their style of it. And uh, such funny people, too. Ryuki's hilarious. It's so cool uh, to be immersed in that culture, huh? Yeah. Like, I've, uh, over that time, the years to going, I've gone to Japan 11, 12 times in, like, a three-, four-year period. One story, though, too, like, I don't know if it had to be their type of thing, but, like, Justin Mulford was out there, too, for a thing. And he's just, like, the classic, like, older brother, like, messing with everybody. Always kind of that big brother mm -hmm. figure. And one day, he just goes to Ryuki. He's like, hey, Ryuki, pull my finger. And he does a pull your finger to, like, fart, you know? And, like, just because Ryuki, like, it, you know, I don't know if he'd never seen that or what, his face to be, like, <laughs> so shocked by this was <laughs> so funny. Yeah, the culture's so different, they probably never seen yeah, anything like that. Yeah, if he'd ever seen it, he's <laughs> literally just straight, like, stunned. <laughs> so Like hilarious. a little kid's reaction. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> but, oh, uh, I don't know if that's even, like. No, I could. So that's solid. That's funny. <laughs> that's solid. That's solid. Um, well, we've been cruising. We gotta. We gotta hit up one last guest question uh, presented by Capita, and this one's from your brother Dylan Lynch. And here we go. Hey, Tyler, it's Dylan. <laughs> so, what's up with Earthships? Yeah, what are they, and what do you love about them? I love that. Thank you, Dylan, because obviously I know he knows how much it means to me, and it would definitely be something I'd want to touch base on with all this you know if there's ever a chance to kind of like i even always had that th thought deep down like if you had the attention of everyone in the world like what would you say type of thing and it's like it's a hard thing to even think and at least you know i'm not talking to everyone but talking to quite a bit of the snowboard community through this whole thing which is pretty incredible and uh yeah, it's um, about the Earthships, you know, we've been talking about it here and there and all of it, but um, when I found out about it, it, like, changed my life. Explain explain what it is, too. So what it is is basically a house, a home that that does it all, you know. it It's it's all about, like, making a house that aligns with the elements of nature to make the whole system work. And it's almost like in nature how there's systems, you know what I mean? And um, and then there's like natural sources of energy all around us, whether it be the sun, the wind, the water, earth, 
and it's trying to tap into what those are and benefits and use it for our human survival. So this guy, Mike Reynolds, who was an architect, went to school for architecture, and then he was trying to come up with like a building to more or less take care of himself, you know? And similarly too, when he talks about his life story, he was getting all this input of like environmental issues and uh, at the same time trying to build a home to take care of himself. So he started to combine these, you know, taking in what is around him and putting it into action. And he created a building using like tires as like the main back of the wall because he found out about like thermal mass when you have a lot of like dense mass, it holds temperature. So the idea was like, okay, you create this big dense back wall to the, and then, so he used tires because there's the environmental issue of tires. Like where do they go? There's mountains of them. So he was also trying to come up with a concept that would be doable for everyone around the world. And he's like, at this point, tires are everywhere in the world. You know what I mean? And there's an excess of them. So trying to find a cheaper building method too. And low tech, that was like a big part of his thing. So like, boom, you fill a tire with dirt and pack it tight, like really pound it in there. And then you got like a dense brick and that will store temperature. So then when you get the temperature from the sun, so you the front of the building or your home would be glass to get that solar energy in. So that comes down to like which direction you face your building to get the perfect amount of sun, how much you tilt the glass for like winter sun, summer sun. So picture you get the sun to heat up the building and then it gets stores the temperature in that back wall. And then that will hold the temperature like through the night type of thing, you know? And, uh, and the same thing, like that would be in the winter when you're trying to warm the place up. And then if, say in the summer when you're trying to like keep it more cool, there's like a cooling pipe that goes underneath the whole back wall. So it'd be like the tire wall is burned over, covered with a bunch of dirt. And anytime too, like you dig a certain amount of depth into the earth, it, re it holds like one solid temperature, doesn't really fluctuate. So when it's hot in the summer, you have like a cooling pipe, a big corrugated tube that comes through the dirt and goes through that temperature of like 55, 60 or whatever. So then when it's hot, you, you open up that, pulls the cold air in, vents to let it out. So more or less you're, you're creating space that can like control its temperature based off of like using the earth's core temperature and then using the sun's like heating potential. And then you like tuck it in there to kind of like, you know, just like how insulation would like help maintain it. It's like you want to really bury this thing in so it holds whatever temperature you're trying to keep it at. And, and then the other side of that would be like solar panels to get your electricity. And then they collect rainwater and store it in big, you know, you store in big tanks and that's how you get your water. And then you have in the front, since it's glass, there's two rows of glass and then in the middle, that area kind of goes through more fluctuation from hot and cold. And just because you have that separation, it's like a buffer zone. So then your actual living space is more constant. And this is able to go through transitions. And then you have your garden in the front to try to grow your food. And it's getting all that. Like a solar. greenhouse, basically. A greenhouse. Yep. And, then, uh, and then he has a system set up to where, like, when you collect the rainwater, you'd filter it to use it for drinking or showering. But then after you like wash your hands or take a shower, that water then goes into the back of the toilet. And then when you, or excuse me, there's one more step. So when you wash your hands, you shower, that water then goes into the planter cells to water the garden. Then when the gardens used it and kind of like use some of that material as food, then that excess water goes to the toilet. And then when you flush your toilet, that goes out to like a septic system to a leach field to feed your like outdoor trees and shrubs and all that. So it's like you kind of like keeping your whole system in one unit. You're, you know, cleaning your own sewage waste. It's kind of like taking care of yourself without being tied into like the grid, like sewage system, electricity system. 
So he was like, you know, an architect and trying to like take in all these things he's learning and put it into like a one functional unit. And um, there was a documentary called The Garbage Warrior. And that's where I first found out about it. It was like the first year after moving out west and then coming back home. So kind of getting to see like, like first experience of like group living, bills, buying your own food, all that stuff, you know. And then I see this documentary. I'm like, oh, this this could be it. You make your home base, then we're kind of like set on the bills. You can chip away at growing your food, you know. And so yeah, it definitely like changed my life when I saw that. And it's just been a dream to figure out how to make it possible. The land, pretty much the whole idea behind getting the land was to like have a space to try to build one of these. Cause they're also like one of those things where like up to code, a lot, a lot of times you can't just go build it in a city or in a neighborhood. Cause he ended up losing his architectural license because the way of building this isn't technically up to code. And that's another thing, like I was saying, like the law at this point doesn't want people to take care of themselves and live off their own. You know, that takes away from their whole system. So one thing you're not mentioning too is how cool these things look too. Yeah. We'll have to put up images right. while you talk. Like cool. they're they're like, awesome looking and the interior is really cool. Yeah, they're pretty like oh the interior too, yeah, so cool. We actually got to go stay in one, which was oh, like really? a long time goal. Zach's mom knew she randomly ended up there, stayed one. She knew we were driving across and she's like, Oh, I'll book you guys a night, like so you can go see it. And just the feeling of being in there, you go in and it's like they're like solid concrete floors of some sort that's part of like the whole mass thing and just knowing like there's it felt like heated floors just because the system of everything and you're walking around feeling it on your feet and you take a shower and knowing that the water is just rainwater that's filtered it like felt extra soft and nice and like all these little things that you have to like feel the feel and after me being obsessed with it for years it was so nice to like be in it yeah, and, like, just that idea of kind of, like, you know, he jokes about it, but it's, like, take care of your own shit. Like, that's a huge part of it, you know what I mean? Whether it be, like, your actual shit or just, like, your own shit. And I just feel it's one of those things, you know, you do your part, you do what you can. I don't know the answer when it comes to cities. Obviously, you couldn't just convert everything here to it, but we could take some of these principles and try to apply them where we can. And then, yeah, if we are setting up a new home, building a new home, try to like use some of these systems or you know it's cool because too he he was doing it here in new mexico and started growing started building little communities then kind of got like shut down by the system more or less you know and i just started doing all these things to like make it work with what they wanted but then they started doing stuff more overseas in like third world countries or like disaster relief in like haiti in other places and you see the way they like embrace it so much like even the governments over there embracing it yeah, i feel like in europe they're all about that huh yeah there's different places at this point they really are kind of like around the world and you see the community of people who have like got what he was putting out there and the way they like embrace it it's like it's amazing and you could tell like the people who feel it it's like this is something special whether this isn't like the and all be all perfect system we need to like start thinking about things more in this way and keep creating like his whole thing too is like we test cars we test airplanes we test bombs why don't we do more housing testing he's like at this point everything's so bound up with like permit this and like what's the word i'm looking for to not permits but just like up to code it's it so limiting code, limiting of what people can do <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah, he's just trying to, like, open up the doors for, like, we need to be trying out more things. He and looks like he uses more concrete, too, and now that wood's yeah. so expensive, I could see people right. maybe finally starting to embrace it, huh? Right, there's concrete. A big part of their, like, thing that everyone knows him for is the tires and then bottles. So he'll use bottles in between the concrete because they keep, like, the form, the solid form of it, so you actually can make use way less concrete. And then the bottles end up turning into kind of like stained glass looking walls. And and then, um, you know, like glass. There's definitely ends up being like, you know, building materials, but he tries to use as many recycled. So then like that, when they go to third world countries or it's like disaster relief, they're going around collecting like whatever useful materials they can use and try to implement that into the building. Even coming down to like stuffing garbage and the shit when they pack it in, they're like, 
it's either gonna go a landfill or it can go here and like and uh yeah even just the way some of that is it's like a reminder in your home of like we need to stop consuming shit just to throw in the landfill so like saw that documentary you know life-changing i really what's it called again it was the name of the documentary uh garbage warrior garbage nice. warrior and it's kind of older now you know but like that like if the way it affected me like i hope like you know parts of that will get other people to you know to appreciate but yeah, since it's then it's earth ships if you want to just look into the subject there's a lot of youtube videos on it but earth ships and earth ships biotexture is their thing and it looks like there's tours of houses on there and we'll yeah. put some in the in the show notes and all yeah. that and they're cool cool looking things a living one look, looks pretty rad right and just knowing like the design is that way because it's for functionality you know what i mean it's more about the function of it so when you look at the building and think like oh that's why it looks like that whether it be like because they're using recycled stuff or because that's what works. They did everything for a reason. Huh? Yeah. That's cool. And it's definitely a, thinking about us as a human race. <laughs> we've been only in the past few hundred years have we gotten to the space where we like pour the concrete foundation, build lumber homes. Like right. it's kind of interesting as humans, we survived for a very, very long time. Right, and like living differently than the majority of our entire majority of our of the human existence, uh, but yeah, conveniences are nice. <laughs> so, but <laughs> so that's right. what you know. You, you you lean on. I think that's humans. You tend to lean towards that. But right. I love it, dude. Yeah. I love it's it. cool. And there are like more like modern kind of like high tech versions of similar things. I think that's a huge part of his stuff. Is he's trying to make something that like you could give the blueprints and like anyone could go do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you could collect a lot of your materials from like a landfill or like trees or whatever, you know, that's a huge part of his trying to have something that's accessible to a broader scale, like a world scale. Like so deep down that dude's like intentions that got him to that point are something that like I admire him for the most. And he had a really cool book to, coming of the wizards and it was like as soon as he got to like living in one of these units and was working he had kind of like a journal and made a book from it and that was really cool you get to like dive deeper into his like thought process and it really made me like look up to him that much more that's awesome well sounds incredible man uh love your passion for earth ships i think it's really dope i'm sure a lot of the listeners will as well and we're gonna get into hot takes now because we've been <laughs> cruising right along now, hot takes is presented by oakley I rock the Oakley line miners. Uh, somebody asked me which low lens lenses I run. I think the Rose. The Rose are good low lens. Those things hit. And first thing we're going to ask is the the GOAT uh, or the MJ of snowboarding, both male and female. Who you got? I was thinking about it, too. Like, obviously, you know, coming to the show, I think about these different ones. and Like that, there's different takes on it. Like, you're saying what it means to you. And, like, you're saying JP just for that, like, overall everything and i think it was one of your like patreons recently who said danny cass and i was like i really like relate to that too because during that time of like getting into snowboarding and the grenade videos being like the main thing that i watched my reference to snowboarding he was that character he was that guy and you wanted to like you know get grenade shit because of danny, you know and uh that yeah and then <laughs> I to Lane in another sense, like Lane, Max brought it up the point of like he's this amazing snowboarder all around, just like you know ATV. But then he makes his own snowboards. He did down at Smokin. He builds the parks. He does everything across the board. And from like another perspective, images like in the sense of favorite snowboarding, it'd be Lane too. Mm -hmm. And then so good. for women, I. Uh, I, I'll give two, two for women, too, because uh, Jamie Anderson, because mm -hmm. obviously just ever since I've known about Jamie Anderson, I feel like she's won every contest I've ever yeah. seen, you know, feel bad at the Olympics, but in my mind, she's like the goat of that mm -hmm. that realm of snowboarding. But then MFR, Marie Francois. She's so dope. Like, when I came to find out about her, like, that's the shit with the earth ships and everything. I know I'm not, like, the first one in this realm, but when I found out and watched some of her, like, the simple things... It was like, wow, like, she's speaking my language, like, so much, you know? And when it comes to, like, like being hard on yourself for, like, what is, my, is this really good for me to be snowboarding when I really care about this environmental stuff? Am I being a big hypocrite? So hearing her, like, she's 
on a soul level, probably one of the closest people I relate to in all this, you know? And then uh, Mike Bassage too. Just oh, wow. There. I feel like he almost kind of built his own version of an earth, oh, earth ship, right? Yeah. Those two, like, in a, to be in the snowboard. And I'm sure there's others that I don't know about, but those yeah. two are like, you know, trying to shape my life to be somewhere in that room. The way Mikey's you know? mind works oh, is just man. incredible. And our land, the property, is kind of near where he bases out of. Like oh, his, really? His, his, like, shop that he had, I think it actually burned down, yeah. unfortunately. I think he's got it a was new in one the now. town closest to the property. I didn't know that at the time. It was just, like, a cool sync up. That's awesome. I love that answer. Uh, next question, who's the most underrated? Like, in our crew of, like, growing up with, my friend Ryan Allaire, like... He kind of like, you know, when it comes down to like going out or riding in the park, all of our friends know he's like one of the most naturally talented, so good. But he just, you know, just certain way of things went. He didn't end up being much, you know, in sponsors and contests and do it. And now he's kind of like, you know, doing other things. But like, yeah, if you go back and watch the GBP anything and see Ryan's footage. Uh, if you could go heliboarding with three people in the world, just for fun, who would it be? Because, yeah, I want to say literally just, like, all the friends, like, all of the GBP crew that we traveled with, that would be unreal, and I hope we can make that happen. But if I had to slim it down to three, I'd say Dylan, my brother, because we just do everything in life together. I wouldn't want to have an experience like that without him. And, uh, oh, I thought about it too. Anthony Mazzotti. Like, just to him, watch him ride a snowboard. Like, you've talked about, like, Ben A. Certain people, like, they don't have to do anything, and it just looks good. I remember being in Japan with Anthony cruising powder, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, that just looks so sick, just how he stands on the board. And that would be amazing to see him in the Alaska environment. I think he'd do it, too. Mm -hmm. it's like, just surf some sick lines. <laughs> and then uh, Lucas, like, Yeah. You know, same thing. He brought me in for everything, and he was bound that for me. But also, too, like, just the way his brain works, to see him in that environment. Like, he won't just settle for, like, oh, I'll cruise this and that. He's going to find something to hit, mm -hmm. something to do, and something different. So that would just be cool to see how that going to make that happen. Like, yeah. I'd like to see Gunnar rip it. I think, too, in the heli, he'd get so excited. It'd yeah. be such an experience. <laughs> right. He'd be barking. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then we got uh, worst trend. What's the worst trend? Ooh, yeah, it's hard work because like that, I I don't want to hate on anything. You know, yeah, you know, I've said you say the worst trend is like just like hating on shit. You know, negativity, negativity. Whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and like I think one that kind of like when I think about it, yeah, negativity. But like the the hate on like the trend of people just saying that like the quad corks and everything is just like too much or like not cool, like. I can understand it. I get it. But, like, when you look through the comments and people just be like, oh, my God, this and that. It's like, to me, it kind of just falls back of, like, we're all just a little jealous. Like, if you could fucking do that, <laughs> that, would be, that would be so fun. Mm -hmm. Like, talk about all this shit being, like, for that, like, adrenaline high. We're all just searching. Like, imagine sending it, some of those quad corks. The way that Sue kid stomped it. Oh at the Olympics, God. imagine being able to ride like that. Like, it's like, crazy. And then, yeah, and then people just want to hate on it. Like, you know, I don't know if there's a point where, like, you're going to be able to do it, but, like, that, in the sense, they can't stop progression. But to me, it's just like, yeah, the feelings, we can't even comprehend how sick that feels, mm -hmm. you know? Imagine the amount of inertia, the way, like, what you, the way Mark dips his shoulder yeah. four times. And actually, right? how do you and land it? And then control it to like land. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, also, the amount of sheer edge control, the way they initiate their line is, and the torsional flex where they zing it off their toe is yeah. just like, it, it's a great point. It is, yeah. uh, it's and like they're obviously too, having yeah. a good time out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like that, like you could say, like, oh, contests kind of push them into a point where they like have to and maybe don't have to. You, maybe you don't want to at that certain time. You like have to do the contest. That's kind of scary. But, like, those kids got to that point for a reason. Like, they love that shit more than anyone. Mm -hmm. They love that feeling of, like, hucking, and that's why they got to that three, four. It's unreal how far it's gone, mm -hmm. you know? You look at Mark and all those contest kids, they snowboard more than anybody I know. Yeah. Those guys are all, what do they do? He's fucking, oh, I'm going snowboarding all day. Yeah. I'll have to Every say while I'm here too, like I was rooting for Mark so tough. 
Yeah. Like even in the one, like I just felt like he got kind of like screwed His over last in run. the ones before, mm-hmm. and then I'm going into this one, seeing him like really rooting, man. Whatever you know, contest to contest, but he put down a heater at least. Art. That's better, yeah, yeah. exactly. And he's to be in the podium on that many Olympics. That's a that's a feat. All right, we got to ask uh, about your setup. What are you rocking? What's your snowboard? <laughs> the snowboard. This is a GBP one. It's about four years old now, and uh, this was a Sawyer Sawyer Dean graphic. Nice. I talk about each one. Kind of was for a friend and idea. <laughs> I actually didn't even think about this too. Connected all back. The first time I ever ate mushrooms was with Sawyer, <laughs> and he looked like a Trix Rabbit to me. This big techno. <laughs> <junkie brand. laughs> That's what inspired the graphic. Yeah. So even like he rode for Solomon, you know, for all oh, those yeah. years. So even as we were making the boards, he was doing Solomon. But we'd talk about a graphic, like if he ever did GBP, like we'd do a trick something. So then it finally, it finally did happen. And like right <laughs> under the binding, he's reaching for some mushrooms. That's what he's kind of like reaching down for. And there's some right here on here. That's tight. But yeah. This one and like that, we haven't been making boards. Like the thing with Jay kind of like fizzled out for whatever reasons, another business shit. We weren't ever really like trying to do full blown work, doing a snowboard company, you know, yeah. I'm grateful how much we got out of it, you know, and I love making graphics. It was that was like a huge part of it. Well, and you guys uh, left your mark and made it happen, so it's a beautiful yeah. thing. And uh, but yeah, still running that one. That's yeah. so dope. Now we got to ask also, uh, what's next? What's next for T Lynch? What do we got on the horizon? Ooh, what's next? So uh, just the land, trying to like work on that more. You know, in the last year, I moved into uh, my buddy Lemmy bought a home in Kings Beach. So that's awesome to be in a rental situation that's, like, chipping towards him owning a home. Mm -hmm. So, like, within the friends, there's someone that has a home base there in Tahoe. And then it's closer to the property than I was living before in South. Like, it was, like, a three-hour drive. Now we're, like, an hour and a half. So that was, like, a huge thing. Okay, I live closer to land. Try to get there more. And, yeah, just... uh, Living with my girlfriend, Allison, you know, we're both on that tip of just trying to, like, manifest dreams and make things happen. She's really a great, like, teammate to have with that, you know. And, uh, you know, we're dreaming all different types of things. Maybe we get our own bus of, like, a minier kind just after seeing how that worked. And after seeing what that bus went through, I'm like, those things are tanks. They can do so much, that thing. And then, uh, yeah, everything with the land, you know, it's like, trying to trust tell myself to just like trust in the time things take time don't give up on it open to the the dream kind of like it can evolve you know as i learn more we can look at it from different ways and just like but the core intention of trying to like set up a home base to grow food and kind of take care of yourself but then also to have a home base to Give back to all the people that help us travel all the years. If anyone else is like traveling about, want a place that we can offer something, you know, give back. And then as we learn more in this realm, just try to share that onward to the community, you know, try things just by doing it. And whatever we learn, we can just kind of share, share that knowledge around. Yeah. I love it. It's beautiful. Love it. Yeah. Uh, do you have, do you want to thank anybody before we wrap this thing up and call it good? Yeah. Thank you to my parents, mom and pop. Heidi and uh, Dylan, you know, the family just raising me, all the friends, too many to name, but you guys all know. Um, yeah, thank you to my girlfriend, Allison, for living life with me, and Lemmy for letting us rent that home from you, and uh, yeah, everyone in my life, thank you all so much. Big thank you to Takashi. Hanasaki for all my trips to Japan. He knows he changed my life with that shit and uh incredible times. Really grateful for that. And um I don't know. Thank you guys. <laughs> I mean there's too many I could go on forever. Yeah, we could yeah. We can oh, I would definitely want to say thank know. you to uh Chelsea and Goggin with uh they own the coffee shop Java Hut that I'm working at. And it's just like family. They they are also snowboarders and started this business just to have something in Tahoe. And I've been working there lately, and it's just cool to have something 
stable and you know working with the friend and family vibe and helping me get by tyler thank you so much for coming on the show appreciate you, you dog it was so fun chatting uh appreciate thank you to everybody that listens to our show we really appreciate you guys and we'll have another episode next wednesday over and out from the bomb hole